Oh, yeah. Told you. I swear I'm prepared. I swear I am. There you go. Um. What's up, guys? That is a, uh, that is, that is a low viewer count start. Some of you know what tradition holds then if there's a low viewer count start. Shit usually gets weird as fuck. <laughs> I'm liking the warmer tones in the, oh, yeah. No. Um, shit usually gets weird as fuck, man. Ugh. Fucking A. Really? Really? Like right now. Like right this second. This is when you text me. Ah, oh, I swear to God. Some people's children. Oh, that just went from even higher to lower. Oh, that's, that's going to be an interesting thing. Oh, shit gets weird. Shit gets really fucking weird when uh, when we start with low numbers. So, we'll see how this goes. Um, <sighs> Kat, uh, Karina, and I got a few hours of uh, seven days in this evening. Um, hey, Infamous, thanks for the follow. Um, yeah. Uh, we were actually, I was actually considering just canceling stream tonight. Um, and, like, if Karina or Kat managed to stay up, we were going to play through. But Kat's trying to sleep. And Karina's actually finally falling asleep, even though when we stop, Karina's like, no, 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 I want to play. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be falling asleep soon. Um... He needs to, he needs to know. He can't be fucking buttoned into these time frames. Um, <clears throat> so, hey guys, I had an interaction with a friend's boyfriend and there were more than a, com uh, there, uh, there were more than a communist party. It got me kind of down. Oh, more flags than a, a communist party. Um, it got, it got me kind of down. Um, Kaiser, there's two schools of thought on that, by the way. Just FYI, as somebody who's been around the fucking block a few times, keep your fucking mouth shut and don't interfere because your friend will take it out on you. Um, and then there's the school that says you have to be like a good friend, even if it means that your friend ends up disowning you completely and you have to speak up and speak your piece. I'm not telling you which avenue to take, but I am telling you that these are the two general schools of thought concerning these <clears throat> those sorts of things that, you know, primarily that's, you know, there's that's in my years, that's what I found. And there's validity to both of them. Um, so it just sort of depends how you feel you want to live your life with your whether you're one of those people that needs to speak your piece and you need to, you know, for better or for worse, you're going to do it. Or you're the one that says, Geez, you know what? They'll take it out on me in the end and I don't want to. So figure yourself out. <clears throat> Um, <sighs> no, that would be interesting. That's some bratty behavior. Either way, sorry, I'm in my own head. <clears throat> what were some of the red flags, guys? What was wrong? Just out of curiosity. Um, oh, let's see. See if I have that video. Hang on. This video is fucking. Uh, uh, oh, you see every, every everybody see um 
Hey, Rumble. Everybody see uh, Alec Baldwin shot a person? <laughs> it's on the prop master as far as I'm concerned. Um, it, 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 yes, nonsense. The door is open. Um, yeah, apparently, um, Alec Baldwin, like, um, discharged a prop gun, but the prop gun had, yeah, caboose, the prop gun had live rounds and, uh, killed the cinematographer and injured the director, right? And, like, here's the thing. When fucking, we were on the, like, Cat, Korean, and I were playing Seven Days, and Angie jumps in on the voice call and tells us this shit. And I said, I'm like, let me guess, it was the director? And she's like, how the fuck did you know? I'm like, and Karina goes, because that's who you point the gun at. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, everybody who's ever held a prop gun in theater, in film, in TV, hates their fucking director for the most part. And if you're going to point the prop gun at somebody, like when they're not, you just, ah, this motherfucker right here, right? You point it at the director. And she's like, well, he, he injured the director of cinema, uh, cinema, uh, director of photography too. And fucking Korean and I both start laughing. We're like, yeah, the DP, fuck them too. They're always fucking hoity-toity artist types. The lighting isn't right. Redo the shot, right? Fuck you, fuck you, right? Apparently he discharged a prop gun and the prop gun had like fucking live rounds or something in it for some reason. I, not, not accordingly. Like apparently they were shot. Um... The cast member now identified as Alec Baldwin was unaware of the type of ammunition in the gun. It had live rounds. The prop gun wasn't so much a prop. Like this is, this is, this is, no, not on, I mean, somebody like the prop master maybe, but not for Alec Baldwin. <clears throat> and I'm not even saying that just because he's Alec Baldwin and he's a fucking actor, right? No, I mean, this is, this isn't on him. The, given the situation, the scenario, no charges would be filed against him. Um, it, 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 this is on the prop master. Like sincerely, if anybody gets charges, yeah. If anybody gets charges, it's on, it's, it's on the prop master or whoever prepped the, the, the props. Yeah. <laughs> so much for practical effects. <laughs> yeah. Caboose, I, they use them. Live rounds are used occasionally on, on set. Um, just like live explosives are. Right. Like there is a pyrotechnics and a demolitions crew and there are firearms experts who they do use occasionally live rounds for shots. Uh, Rumble, thanks for the gift sub. Um, but. Yeah. <clears throat> like the, the, the in this case, it's going to be the prop master or the armorer. These are the two positions that I would immediately be hauling in and being like, what the fuck, guys? What the fuck? <laughs> why did you hand... Why Why did Alec Baldwin have a gun loaded with live rounds handed to him and he wasn't aware of it? Sup, homie? <clears throat> All right. Practical as you can get. Um... They're, they're investigating. <laughs> they're investigating. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all I can say. It's a fucking goofy ass story. Um, okay, let me see if I can't find that video. Uh, oh, I know where to find it. I know where to find it. Yep. I knew where it was. Oh, uh, I know who posts that shit. Um, yes, um, all of the meat and blood and viscera, uh, viscera, right, Viva? Also, um, the fucking chainsaw at one point had a live chain on it. Um, because I remember the story about how, um, I forget who played um, played the, it did the actor that played the, uh, played Leatherface. Um, but there's that scene in the dark where he's chasing the girl down the like driveway 
with the chainsaw in the mask with a live chain. And, like, if he had stumbled and fallen, like, just, <coughs> like, it would have been a thing. Also, the um, blood, like, when he cuts her finger and sucks the blood or the thumb or whatever, that shit was real, yo. And she didn't know it was going to happen. Um, the actor who played Leatherface got so sick and tired. They had the, 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 the knife blade taped. Um, and so he, it, they had to redo the take so many times. He got sick and fucking tired of doing the take. He takes the, 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 um, the tape off of the blade, really slices her fucking thumb while she's like restrained and tied up and fucking sucks the blood off for real. Yeah. When you see that scene in the movie, that's real. And she didn't know it was happening and she did not consent to it. It's fucked. No, no, okay, this is years ago. No, he did not. Um, oh, you want fucked. All right, you, you guys like, this is, okay, you want fucked movie making? Go to Hong Kong. Hong Kong action movies basically just throw stunt bodies at things, right? Like, fuck harnesses, fuck safety lines, fuck a belay, fuck clipping in. We're going to put you on a car, and you guys are going to fight kung fu style while we suspend the car from a helicopter and fly over the bay. Well, is there any sort of safety? Yeah, 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 get on the fucking car. I can pull up a scene from a movie where that shit's just straight up. They just were like, and we're doing it. Yeah, Hong Kong filmmaking is psychotic. Um. Hey, Rumblefish, thank you for this. Uh, the, another gift sub. Um. Oh, this one. Okay, so this this right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. Hang on here. Let's. Okay, so just so everybody knows. I'm going to be like slightly lethargic. One, I've been playing video games for a couple of hours, like a few hours straight. But two, I just had a plate of fried chicken and a sweet potato covered in coconut sugar and maple syrup, right? Like I am stuffed full and I am fighting the itis as it were, right? So just, just, just contextualize. That's where Kai is right now. And when I mean a plate full of fried chicken, I mean a plate full of fried, uh, fried chicken. All right. Um, uh, yes, Jackie Chan is apparently not a great human being. Um, let's just put it that way. Oh, here we go. It was those people going after him. I saw that. Yes. I saw that. There were people going after you, and they went at, the cops went after you and not the other white guy. I saw that shit. Angry white girl you, energy. You were the one that was being accosted. There was a couple like white guys over there that were going after him. They got out of his vehicle and he was trying to back away. Oh, one of these cops actually believed the white guy when they said this guy was the one in the fucking wrong. That's what fucking happened. I don't give a shit. Well, if you're not going to contribute positively, God bless that angry white girl energy. Fucking, if you're not going to contribute positively, I don't give a shit. <laughs> God bless her. Love her. <laughs> yeah, why didn't you pull, up the, pull over the other guys that were part of it? We're done. Okay, good. I told you what happened. I told you what happened. This guy was accosted by other people, and he was the one that was pulled. Yeah. Right? Like, she straight up rolled up on their punk asses. So I saw the whole fucking thing. You didn't believe, you believe the white guy. Why is he my fucking, <laughs> yeah, fucking, if you're not going to contribute positively, 
fuck you. <laughs> I just fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I'm an angry white chick from middle class America. What the fuck are you going to do to me, motherfucker? You going to put me on the ground? You going to put a knee on the back of my head? I, I hope she's blonde, too. I hope she's a fucking angry, like, middle American blonde chick. Just like, fucking, I will be on every news station if you do that shit to me. Right? Like, just straight up knows it. Just straight up knows it and is just leaning into them. It's fucking great. And you see what happens afterwards. If you were watching the cops in the background, they had him fucking hands behind the back over the fucking car. And she rolled up on their asses and started chewing them out and talking about how they fucking believe the white dude and not him and how he was the one being accosted. And then all of a sudden the fucking cop gets off his fucking hands and the other cop like points him to the front of the car to sit there instead. Yeah. Like straight up. What's she look like? Oh, sweet. Yeah. She's actually kind of badass. Look at her. Huh. Is my is my for you page also coming out of retrograde? All right. I dig the aesthetic. I dig the aesthetic. All right, Kaiser, let me go back. <clears throat> I, I I just wanted to do that first, Kaiser. Um she visited in Portland, so wanted to hang and catch up. And she told us she was free to hang, but she was telling her boyfriend has all sorts of rules about her being outside and independent. Yeah, no, ditch him. Fucking ditch him. Uh, he has her uh, Discord login and tells us we can never see her. Oh, yeah, that's super abusive. Keep in mind, she's way younger than him. Also, her previous relation was toxic, too. Kaiser, that's, 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 that's the kind of shit that you need to fucking just... Uh, honestly... I'd step in on that one. I'd be like, look, you may hate me for saying this. You may never want to be my friend again for me saying this. This motherfucker is abusive, and you need to get away from him fast. Yeah, like, that's 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 not, like, that's not, like, red flag. Like, this dude's just kind of a douchebag. Fucking, like, look, they're terrible together, and they shouldn't be together, and it's just a bad, like, not a good relationship. Sort of stepping in. Like, that's actual abuse. Yeah, like that's, that's, no, like that do huge red flags, huge red flags. Controlling her fucking online account like that and then forbidding her from seeing friends. Oh, yes. Yeah, I'd, I'd fucking step up in that. I'd step up on that one in a heartbeat if that were me. You do you again, Kaiser. Don't, don't let me ever tell you to how, how to live your life. But yeah, on that one, I'd fucking sit her down in a heartbeat. Yeah. I'd fucking have friends run, run interference, dude. You got people. You have, you've got people. I'd fucking like tell tell her he can come out with you. If he's concerned, he can come out with her and then fucking run interference and pull her out of there. Straight up. I'd I'd do some shit, but that's just me. Um <clears throat> Yeah. I I'd fucking shut that shit down real fast. Yeah, cupcake. I'm I'm on that team too. I I just you know mm, yeah I'd shut that down. <sighs> Should fucking um, I don't know what we're gonna do. We started off in politics, but I don't know if I feel like dude. Like I said, plate full of fried chicken. I don't know if I've got politics in me right now. <clears throat> oh wait, you know what? We can fucking we can just do another fucking angry like get our rage boners going. A four foot eight woman, black woman, was accosted by a group of boys. Minutes later, Louisiana deputy was flinging her by her hair. Uh huh. See if that's the video. Oh, that's the fucking Amber Geiger. What the fuck? Yeah. Um, 
Arnold's horrific experience started on that Monday, well before her interaction with the deputy. Bystanders told the outlet that Arnold's slim frame and a missing eye she suffered from a prior car accident made her an easy target for three boys. It accosted her minutes before the deputy arrived. The youths beat the woman and slammed her to the ground as bystanders jeered as she tried to defend her stick, uh, herself with a stick. That attack, which also captured on cell phone video, went on minutes until 71-year-old Lionel Gray ran the boys off. 71-year-old had to fucking fix this situation. When Jefferson Parish deputies caught up to Arnold, who was walking home covered in dirt in a di general state of disarray, she refused to talk about the incident. Can't imagine why. She's not in a mood to talk, a mood to talk anymore. <clears throat> Witnesses said that the deputy stopped his vehicle, grabbed the woman, threw her to the ground as Arnold flailed fruitlessly against the much larger man, and ultimately ending up with the deputy crouching down and putting a knee on the woman's back. I don't know why the conservatives want to go back to 1950. Seems like we're still living in it. Yes, right? Conservatives care about tyranny, except when it's already here for some reason. We only have the highest prison population on the planet. <laughs> Your voice forces the most pro black institution you have to speak about. <clears throat> um, Amherst is right, by the way. They don't think they're people. But I, and also, here's the thing. Here's the here's the here's the dirty little truth. Here's the dirty little secret. Cops don't think you're people either. Black people are less less people, but cops don't see any of us as people. That's why they call you civilians, and shit like that. Right? They're, they're, it's the othering. It's the psychological othering that they do. Mm. They don't think they don't see any of us as people unless you uh happen to have connections like i said i've 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 seen it happen live i've seen it fucking happen live um i've been on the like we've i've talked about it at length before right i've got those connections and like i mean this fucking cut nhp fucking hauled me over to the side of the road and because arizona orders their driver's license history their their uh, their driver's record history opposite of nevada he read it the incorrect way and he thought i was still on a fucking suspended learner's permit years later we're talking years later and so he's fucking trying to impound my car and arrest me and shit and so I fucking called my stepdad. Straight up. He, oh, you should have seen how this cop was fucking treating me. And he, he fucking, as soon as I called my stepdad, he's like, I'll handle it. He called the captain. Captain called the cop on his cell. What the fuck are you doing? Let him go. Yeah. You're fucking around with a judge's son right now. Get him on his way. Tow truck. Get the fuck out of here. Like, literally, it's there. Like, no, 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 no. Get the fuck out of here. Here's your ID. You're free to go. Have a great day. Sorry about that. Just like that. <clears throat> now he's apologizing to me. Shit's for real. They don't give a shit about you until they're made to give a shit about you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, Emrys. Oh god, we have some fucking person. I created a fucking I love these accounts that are like fucking a week or two old even at most. Hey, Deirdre. So what's home? What's up, homie? You want to come on the air and have a conversation? Two thousand and eight, Jewjoy. 
<clears throat> really? Because it's October 9th of this month. We have all your account data. As streamers, we get you all your account data. We get your fucking chat logs and everything. Yeah. Scary, huh? Your reputation can precede you. Oh, Kvass. Your, 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 your form of chaos is always interesting, Kvass. So, what's up, Doss? Hey, J. Miles, to be honest, cops just get a bad rap because of situations like the one George Floyd. It's well known that when you have drugs in your system and someone kneels on your neck, then it causes the drugs to potentiate up to 100 times and kill you immediately. Those cops did nothing wrong. Oh, it was the drugs, and now we have lots of hate towards cops, and it's a mess. Fucking J. Miles. Fucking... <laughs> You've been, you've, been trying to, you've been just trying to see if you can fucking get... Sarcasm. It's amazing. It is. Cupcake. You have to understand. Jay Miles is like literally. No. No. Shit. Miles is not. Miles is fucking with people. Okay. Miles is fucking with people. Yeah. Um, he's, he's satirizing fucking idiots. Um. <laughs> and then Neil and just made it go down to his stomach. Duh. Yeah. No, I don't click links from first time viewers. Especially if they've not introduced themselves and they just put a random link into chat. Also, by the way, the Twitch system now gives us quick previews of what the links that are put in. So we don't have to access them ourselves and expose us. Just FYI. It's, it's like I said, <clears throat> when we start a show on a, on a late night, especially, and it starts with a low number, shit gets weird. So we'll see. <laughs> Class. Um, so a half a million South Korean workers have walked, walked off the job in a general strike. Yeah. Half a million fucking South Korean workers. We're on strike. Imagine if a half a million workers in America just singularly just were on strike. Oh no, Chew Toy, it's still early. Trust me. It'll end up in it'll end up in Apple's territory. If you don't know that reference, sorry. Oh, caboose. I love that shit. I absolutely adore that shit. Um that like well, you see, minimum wage shouldn't be raised for these fucking fast food and restaurant workers because that's the job of a teenager. And then fucking nobody wants the job anymore. And then they fucking complain. God damn it. Nobody will fucking do these jobs anymore because they're so fucking lazy. It's like, hmm, interesting. It's almost like you're experiencing the, mar the, uh, the invisible hand of the market. Hmm. I think these are some of those market forces y'all talk about so much.
No, Miles, because I can tell you um, at this point, I it, look, it, it, there, there's it, maybe, maybe, big maybe, big maybe. Samson thinks we follow. Big maybe. But given that AI training and um, algorithmic programming can carry an inherent biases, um, and we've evidenced this before, we've, we've got numerous um, AIs uh, or machine language uh, and neural network trains, uh, trained up uh, neural networks that exhibit these sorts of biases. Um, it's a big maybe. It depends on is it open source? What data was it trained on? Who had their hands on the system last? It's, it's iffy. It's iffy. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, robot police, human police, it doesn't matter. Fuck the police. It's been a while since I played this sound clip. Um, Fuck the police. there you go. It isn't a general intelligence, and but Chutoy. If we start using a general artificial intelligence for policing, we got bigger issues. Thank you, Kaiser. Um, we got bigger issues then. Yeah, uh, that that would freak me the fuck out. If we started using a general uh, a general AI for policing. Yeah, that's worrisome. Sensei rules. Thanks for the follow. Um, God, I would love to see a general strike like that here. We do. Chomp. No, we so fucking do. <clears throat> um, all right, so we talked about that one. We talked about that one. Oh, here's a fun fact for you. Hey, Cricks. Um, safe on your way home. It costs the U.S. government $60 billion more than they receive from st uh, federally backed student loans to administer the loans that they actually receive in, right? It costs us money to collect student loans. You could write off student loans tomorrow in their entirety, and we would save money doing it. <clears throat> Just a little, an aside for you. Just a fun fact about how our system's running. I'll have to find you one. Cupcake. And to tell you right now, right now, I'm probably not going to find it. Uh, not that it's not out there. It's just some fucking, like I said, plate full of hot chicken. Um, I'm thinking we're missing something. True toy. I mean, there's always the pro promise of quantum computing. Don't know. X, Y, Z. But true toy, here's, here's what I can tell you. <clears throat> um, approximately a month before uh, the Wright brothers created sustained human flight, the um, the New York Times said so said something along the lines of "We were thousands of years away from doing it." I'm not kidding you. Like, so. Generally speaking, when somebody says something is, is some technological development is X amount of time out, um, Das, I make all my own food. I don't eat outside food. Um, well, but that we don't know, Chutoy, this we don't know what we don't know, right? Could be tomorrow, could be a hundred years, but we don't know. We don't know that. We don't know the missing element, right? Um, yeah, but nobody knows Richard Pierce's name, so Rumble, it doesn't fucking matter. Right? Like, if you're going for a, com a conversational topic and you're trying to get people, like, the relationship to it and in relation to the New York Times article, which a month later, right? I mean... I mean, it's just, it's just nobody knows who that fucking dude is. 
Um, we did nuclear fusion, and yeah, I mean that's that's we've we we we're. It's well, I mean, there's even an argument about the Wright brothers being the first. There's some fucking other group that claims that they had it. Either way, I don't care. I don't care. I'm full of fried chicken, and these sorts of fucking pedantic, nuanced things are not on the top of uh, top of my head right now. I don't give a shit. The whole point of that was that when it comes to breakthrough technological developments, it's impossible to predict when the breakthrough happens. <clears throat> it could be, again, tomorrow or a hundred years, a thousand years. We don't fucking know. All war movies made in South Korea are anti-war. That's, that, that feels like, that feels like there's gotta be an exception, right, Kaiser? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that, that, that kind of absolutist statement. I was like, eh, feels like. Um. Okay, fair enough. <sighs> um. Um, oh, um, Buffalo, New York, and Staten Island. Um, these are the two places you got to keep an eye on right now for the labor movement, just FYI. Um, Buffalo, New York, they're trying to start the first Starbucks workers union, and Staten Island is pushing for the first Amazon union. After Bessemer, Alabama failed, Staten Island is giving it a crack, and like I said, um, fucking Buffalo, New York the Starbucks workers there are trying to unionize. So Buffalo, New York and Staten Island, New York are the places to keep your eyes on right now for labor movement. Movement. So. Uh, also. Idea. For those of you that are American, yeah, no, that was Jay. They were attempting to do it in Bessemer, Alabama. Didn't pass. Um, idea. Spread this around. Black Friday is bullshit. Black Friday is bullshit. If you know somebody who works retail, tell them to quit on Black Friday. If you have the time and energy to do so, go get a job at one of those big box stores for Black Friday and quit. Labor is making movement for the first time in the history of this country. Like, the first time in the history of our lifetimes in this country, right? It's been a long time since labor made movements in this country. Labor's actually making movements. Pandemic helped. Right? It's time to add to the... the, the every ripple can form a wave and every wave can become a tsunami. Right? It's time to do that. Just, just an idea. Right. If you know retail workers, tell them and they want out and they're looking to change jobs, tell them to quit on Black Friday. Fucking if you've got the time and energy to do it, go get hired. They need seasonal workers. Trust me, they'll hire you. And then quit on Black Friday. Just fuck this system entirely. Hey, uh, hey, Gemma. Eh, you know. All right. So what was this thing? So I. Uh, I found out about this logistics shipping thing. What if instead of a strike where you don't work, you do a strike where you block the roads? Um, seems like that's the play. Um, here's the children of Adam. Um, if I got any, I got any caps for me? Um, so, no. All you're doing is disrupting potential medical and um, food and other necessary good supply lines by doing that. Here's what you do. 
you do what the Japanese bus drivers do when they go on strike. Japanese bus drivers are the model of striking. They truly are. They keep, they go to work. They don't say shit about what they're going to do that day. They get their fucking buses. They go out on the roads. They do their routes. And they don't take any money. This is how Japanese bus drivers strike. They literally just keep it on the hush. They fucking go into work. They pick up their buses. They do their fucking routes. And they don't take a single cent for it the entire fucking day. So the French public transport did it too? There you go. See? This is how you fucking strike. Grocery store clerks. Don't take a fucking cent for it. Just doop, doop. Remember, you want the inventory to be accounted for. Doop. Doop. You want them to know exactly how much they lost. Doop. Doop. Have a great day. Gas station attendants. Need 20, uh, 20 on three. Okay. 20's on three. Don't I know anything? No, you're good. We're running a special. Right? Fucking everything keeps moving. Everybody gets what they need, but no money changes hands. That doesn't affect you and I. That affects the capitalist masters. That affects the ones who are reliant upon that, the metrics and the mechanisms of the system. They could, children of Adam, but what happens when 25,000 people do it simultaneously? What happens when the system's already doing illegal things to you? What happens when they've made general striking illegal per the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947? What happens when you do do a legal, perfectly legal strike as the transportation, uh, um, as, the, um, as the air traffic controllers did under the Reagan administration and the federal government stepped in and illegally forced them back into work and nullified their right to strike? forced them into a job slavery at that point what do you do at what point are you willing to put them put some skin in the game or would you just rather go to your grave as a bootlicking supplicant and just say well you know you got to do what you got to do to get along it's your choice to make I'd rather reform labor in this country. I'm a student of history. Like, look, I know this stuff. It, it, I'm tired as shit tonight, right? Again, plate of fried chicken. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is if you study the 1880s to the 1920s labor movement... Look, in no way, shape, or form am I advocating violence. I would never advocate for anything along those lines. But here's the truth of the matter. Between 1880 and 1920s, the most gains in ground was made by the labor movement in North America. M mines that had children in them, that were literally collapsing on their workers, that, uh, that had robber barons running them, that were... Ba uh, that were summarily executing people. The Pinkertons that were fucking literally assassinate, assassinating labor movement leaders, right? Fucking people go in and blow the mine up. They'd chain the warehouse shut and they'd burn it to the fucking ground. Women during the suffragettes movement would hunt down uh, uh, factory bosses and beat them in the streets, would whip them, right? Like... Um, <laughs> I've got, if you want a uh, nuclear down below, go to my YouTube page, uh, or here, if you want to hear the, the history of it, I can give you the direct link here. Hang on. Um, but yes, the long and short of it is where is the, uh, history of May Day and why labor, uh, why labor day is a sham. Here you go. Yes. 
the long and short of it is that, yes, the U.S. Um, didn't want the um, labor movement associated with Labor Day, so they put it where it is. You're welcome, Nuclear. I will tell you the history of May Day and the Haymarket uh, Massacre in that video. I will walk you through it, and then I'll explain uh, what was going on and why they didn't want it associated with it. Um, wild strikes were successful enough in Germany to be outlawed. They are outlawed here as well. Wild stri uh, Wildcat strikes are, um, we call them wildcat strikes, Viva, but wildcat strikes are illegal in the U.S. as well per the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act. Yes. No, Adam, it didn't. It improved things greatly. What happened was people got complacent and apathetic. A generation two came along that felt that they were deserved of these generous, uh, these well deserved gifts when in fact they were hard fought victories and then they climbed up that ladder and they pulled the ladder up behind themselves if you think for a second that it didn't produce results then you're a fool who doesn't know history it got us huge victories Well, then fuck off. If you want nihilism, go somewhere else. I refuse to placate your nihilism. Then you are then you are happy to be a bootlicking supplicant. And I suggest you go fondle the balls of your local police, gobble his cock, and thank your daddy for protecting you from the scary black and brown people. I will not placate that uh, you think Francis Bellamy and Henry uh, Henry George had a large influence in the labor movement in the US time not a, I, Rumble I wouldn't say no I wouldn't say a large I wouldn't say a large I mean they for sure would be in, in, no no not a large one The reason kids aren't in mines is because of that 1880s to 1920s labor movement. The reason the meat packing plants don't literally end up with people falling in the grinder on a regular basis is because of that movement. The reason that fucking women managed to get into the workplace is because the groundwork that they laid, the likes of fucking Emma Goldman and all of her sisters and compatriots, right? The reason that we started, to, I mean, Jesus fucking Christ, the reason we have a five day work week. The reason that we have oversight in these workplaces, all because of that. Well, what you gonna do? Roll over and die then. Are the corporations not the ones that, that will take us into space and colonize the planets? Collective action by the populace got us into space in the first place, not the corporations. Only once the public sector proved that it could be done and ate the initial cost for the technologies and engineering, then, then business was uh, was willing to get into it themselves and only if the public sector still subsidized it. Fucking Elon Musk wouldn't have shit if it weren't for fucking government loans. No interest. Government backed loans well no 
Ray. It's not a perfectly good political system. That shit's fucked as well. But being nihilistic about it is pointless. Yeah. Government-backed research, government-backed, which, which at the end of the day is just public money. It's money from the commons. Right? The public made that happen. Corp I feel sorry for you. Like, legitimately, I feel sorry for you. Like, I pity you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not memeing here or whatever, however you would put it. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not doing this as a debate tactic. I legitimately pity you. That's sad. Wow. That's rough. Oh, yeah, Bezos literally did. Well, he's suing, yeah, over um, the fact that uh, SpaceX got the award because he wasn't told that the astronauts had to make it back alive and that the thing had to operate in darkness. How are we to know our, space sh our spaceship should need to work in darkness? Oh, and you want them to be brought back alive? Jeez, talk about... Man, this is tough. Oh, fuck. You got to put this stuff in a brief for us. Hey, burger. Um, this and that, burger. This and that. How how is uh how are things in India, burger? Was that? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Holy shit, I can finally fucking do it. Give me a second here. I'm just doing a thing. I'm doing a thing. Wrong tab entirely. Must take a while to confirm. Oh well. Oh well. It's gonna do a thing. Um <laughs> I know, right, Viva? Um, there are rumors that the petrol price surge is used to fund the free vaccine program. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um Oh, a uh, fucking Ray, Ray. He he just wants his he just wants a company down on Mars. That's all he wants. Elon just wants to be fucking By the way, um there's actually a old book series. I forget. Oh god, Stanley. Oh, I forget who wrote it. Basically, the King of Mars, the title of King on Mars in this science fiction series is is Elon. So rather than Lord or King Musk, it would be Elon Musk. Elon's name 
is literally from a fucking science fiction book series in which that word is the title of king and lord of all of Mars. He wants to be king of Mars. He wants company towns on Mars. That's what he wants. He wants to be a fucking neo-feudalist lord. Cupcake, I have no idea if it's coincidental or not, but it's a real fucking thing. Um... Yeah, it's Kim Stanley Robinson. It's the Mars Trilogy. Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. It's about the ter- uh, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. It's about the terraforming of Mars. It, it creates, it's, it's fucking, it's this, it chronicles the settlement of Mars, the terraforming po- uh, process of Mars, and then the sociological buildup of Mars into a society. It's yeah, it's Kim Stanley Robinson. And yeah, yeah, the the leader of Mars is title their title in the series is Elon. I don't know if it's a coincidence. I have no idea. Uh well, no, no, no. It's got to be a coincidence because the fact of the matter is is that Elon was born before the books were published. It's just a fucking rando fucking coincidence, but it's weird as shit, man. telling you this is why we live in a simulation um hey versa yeah it is it's fucking weird as hell but yes um let's see is there anything else that i really wanted to talk about talk about <sighs> of course. Or Katie Bugnova. Um. <laughs> Taco. <clears throat> All right. So. Wait, why is this? Why is this scrolled this far down? I. I oh, no, I covered that. All right. So I'm trying to work my way through this document. It's not the most interesting thing, but I'm trying to get all the recordings done of it. So I have like a playlist in the future that I can just point people to and is a recitation of this document because some people don't fucking like to read and so they fucking they they need to listen. Um yeah, we bagging on space dicks tonight stuck. Um for a little bit we were, for a moment. Yeah, we were bagging on space dicks. Um Oops. Give me a sec here. All right, cool. Um, so if y'all will allow me, if you will humor me, I would like to get another, like, two sections done, maybe. Right? Maybe two sections. If you'll bear with me. I, I know it's not the most interesting thing. Um, uh, yeah, Versa, give me a sec. Give me a sec. I got a couple of African ones. G- give me a sec.
Okay, Versa. Um, Versa, you have the Anarch and Af- uh, African Anarchism one. Look into Anarcho Blackness as well. Um, there's not a shit ton of uh, of formalized anarchism in Africa. Um, hey, Raphael. So you're gonna you're gonna not have a ton of reading material, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, yeah, you're not gonna have a ton. Um, you're welcome. Uh, he is, yeah, he's not, oh, let me check, but no, he's, he's not, he's, uh, um, he, he's, is he not, he's, he's communist and also like, isn't, uh, Bagheet Singh also like really liked by the Hindu nationalists as well, Burger? right? Like the commies love him and also like the Hindu Nats love him from what I remember. Um... This this fucking link needs to get out of my goddamn history. A lot of um stuck a lot of what you're gonna find in um like the anarchist library about Africa isn't going to be very much of like anarchist uh, uh anarchism Af- uh, like African anarchism. It's going to be more anarchistic analysis of African issues, um, colonialism and, uh, imperialism and that sort of thing. Um, what's up, Ro Exotic? Not, I don't, do I know you, Ro? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I know you. Um, but I'm guessing Libra may have brought you here. (laughs) Libra, thank you for the, uh, thank you for the resub. Um, either way, how did your stream go? Yep, it was Libra, I knew it. Um, Ro, how was your stream? What do you do? Um, and shout out auto should have auto happened, right? When you rated in, let me just check. Yes. So everybody go follow Ro Exotic if you aren't already. Let's see. What were you doing? Epstein's Island, uh, streaming Doomer content about politics, soccer, and something else. I, I think I see. Um, so, um, I was just about to start, um, Okay, so Bagheet Singh was pan-communist. He took a lot of inspiration from August Valiant. Uh, Hindu nationalists love him because for many years they appropriated him. He was a staunch anti-communalist and atheist. Interesting, Versa. Yeah. Uh, Good night, Ro. Sleep well. Take care of yourself. Um, Oh, which Twitch streamers went to the island? Mike from PA. Allegedly. <laughs> did somebody throw Mike from PA under the bus? Just answer me that. Did hey, Libra said you read my mind? Fuck it, I knew somebody had to throw Mike from PA under the bus on that one. <laughs> He's just, he has quickly he has quickly become the nickelback of Twitch streamers. <laughs> Oh, I love that. You didn't have it the balls to say it with Ray and Chad. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> he's become, he's straight up as he's he's become the nickelback of fucking Twitch. Oh, I love that. No. Uh. Oh, man. All right. Either way, guys that just came, uh, guys that just came in. So basically, what I'm trying to do is read my way through. <laughs> Fucking a. All right, I will do this, and then I have to start doing something, Libra.
All right. So I'm trying to work my way through the anarchist FAQ on um, why ANCAPs aren't anarchists. Oh, there we go. Get this fucking skirt out from under me correctly. Um, and I'm trying, I'm going to put it all in a playlist, right? So, um, don't disrespect Nickelback like this. Um, that way I have literally just a YouTube playlist of like chapters of the FAQ. Right. That way I can just when people like, well, why aren't uh, ANCAPs anarchists? Like here is a fucking 50 hour playlist of just here is broken down by chapter and section. Right. Like I'm just trying to like get that together, which reminds me um, I should go to my make echoes account and get that video downloaded. Um. All right, so total clips, total clips, total clips, there. All right. Um, clip management, download the clip. Open it. Cool. All right, that way I have that. Oh, let me, um, while I'm at it, I'll start this as a, just a thing, a folder on my desktop. Um and craps there we go we'll just start that because i i i'm you guys know you guys know right like i've finally snapped i'm fucking sick of hearing these fuckers in my spaces right like i know that's like authoritarian and shit no i'm tired of fucking like you know this is this is like anti-fascist dealing with fascists right there's only so much tolerance before the tolerance paradox kicks in these are fucking capitalists operating in bad faith, trying to invade leftist spaces, trying to align or use our anarchism as fucking bad, uh, as inorganic cover for their shit neo-feudalist positions. I'm fucking sick of it. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm fucking sick of it, so I, I just want to fucking, like, and look, I, I've done my spiels. But the the fact of the matter is, is that like you can like the the anarchist uh, the anarchist FAQ has such a beautiful long document about this that there's no point in me like re like reinventing the wheel on this. So I'm just going to read it and go from there. All right. So this is hold on. Let me just check this really quickly. Is anarcho capital All right, so this is... This is the... This is the prefix... Hold on, bear with me. This is... One and the prefix. Okay, so... Prefix in chapter one. All right. Oh, hey, Frackle. So this is, um, oh, I should do uh, a chapter in and 1.0. We'll just do 1.0 because they do it in 1.1, 1.2 sections, that sort of thing. So forgive me if I don't do a whole lot of interacting with chat. What I'll do, okay, so like I'm going to try and do 1.1 and 1.2 here. And in between them, I will take a break and we can sort of have a little back and forth uh, so, yeah, just just bear with me, guys. I, I feel like I need to do this as an anarchist, as a as a propagandist, as an educator. Um, sugar taco, they're essentially just neo feudalists. <sighs> Here we go. Actually, let me get a drink first. Chapter 1, Section 1. Why is the failure to renounce hierarchy the Achilles heel of right-wing libertarianism? 
any capitalist system will produce vast differences in economic and social wealth and power. So we argue in section 3.1. Such differences will reflect themselves in the market and any free contracts agreed there will create hierarchical relationships. Thus, capitalism is marked by hierarchy. See section B.1.2. And unsurprisingly, right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists fail to oppose such free market generated hierarchy. Both groups approve of it in the capitalist workplace or rented accommodation, and the right libertarians also approve of it in a minimal state to protect private property. So-called anarcho-capitalists, in contrast, approve of the use of private defense firms to protect property. But the failure of these two movements to renounce hierarchy is their weakest point, for anti-authoritarianism has sunk deep roots into the modern psyche as a legacy of the 60s. Many people who do not even know what anarchism, uh, anarchism is have been profoundly affected by the personal liberation and counterculture movements of the past 30 years, epitomized by the pro a popular bumper sticker, Question Authority. As a result, society now tolerates much more choice than ever before in matters of religion, sexuality, art, music, clothing, and other components of lifestyle. We need only recall the conservatism that reigned in such areas during the 50s and during contemporary times, Texas, to see that the idea of liberty has made tremendous advances in just a few decades. Although this liberatory impulse has so far been confined almost entirely to the personal and cultural realms, it may yet be capable of spilling over and affecting economic and political institutions, provided it continues to grow. The right is well aware of this, as seen in its ongoing campaigns for family values, school prayer, suppression of women's rights, again looking at you Texas, fundamentalist Christianity, sexual abstinence before marriage, and other attempts to revive the Aussie and Harriet mindset of the good old days. This is where the efforts of cultural anarchists, artists, musicians, poets, and others are important in keeping alive the idea of personal freedom and resistance to authority as a necessary foundation for economic and political restructuring. Indeed, the libertarian right as a whole support restrictions on freedom as long as it's not the state that's doing it. Their support for capitalism means that they have no problem with bosses dictating what workers do during worker hours, nor outside working hours if the job requires employees take drug tests or not be gay or trans in order to keep it. If a private landlord or company decrees a mandatory rule or mode of living, workers and tenants must love it or leave it. Of course, that the same argument also applies to state laws is one hotly denied by these same right-wingers. A definite case of not seeing the wood for the trees. Of course, the so-called anarcho-capitalists will argue workers and tenants can find a more liberal boss or landlord. This, however, ignores two key facts. Firstly, being able to move to a more liberal state hardly makes state laws less offensive, as they themselves will be the first to point out. Secondly, looking for a new job or home is not easy. Just moving to a new state can involve drastic upheavals, so, change, uh, so changing jobs and homes means even more change. Moreover, the job market is usually a buyer's market, except maybe right now. It has to be in capitalism. Otherwise, profits are squeezed. And this means that workers are not usually in a position, unless they organize, to demand increased liberties at work. It seems somewhat ironic to say that, the le at, the least, uh, at the least, that right-wingers, right-libertarians, and so-called anarcho-capitalists place rights of property over the rights of self-ownership. Even though, according to their ideology, self-ownership is the foundational right from which property rights are derived. Thus, in these ideologies, the rights of property owners to discriminate and govern the propertyless are more important than the freedom from discrimination, i.e. to be yourself, or the freedom to govern oneself at all times. So, when it boils down to it, they're not really bothered about restrictions on liberty, 
And indeed, they will defend private restrictions on liberty with all their might. This may seem a strange position for self-proclaimed libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists to take, but it flows naturally from their definition of freedom. But by not attacking hierarchy beyond certain forms of statism, they fundamentally undermine the claims that they then make. Freedom cannot be compartmentalized. It's holistic. The denial of liberty in, say, the workplace quickly results in it being denied elsewhere in society due to the impact of the inequalities it produces, just as the degrading effects of wage labor and the hierarchies with, uh, with which it are bound up are felt by the worker outside of work. Neither the Libertarian Party nor so-called anarcho-capitalists are genuinely anti-authoritarian, as those who truly dedicated to liberty must be. One section down. How we doing? Everybody good? I'm going to take a drink. I'm going to do next section. For those of you who are here for the first one, right? The, the, these sections are a little smaller than the prefix and the first main chapter were. They were a fucking long haul. We're talking 45 minutes sort of thing, right? Um, like I said, I just want to get these. I want to get these parsed out. I want to get this done. Just so I can fucking like point somebody to it and be like, there, go do the thing. Um, the next section's a little uh, is longer, probably three times longer. Um, but <clears throat> all right. <sighs> Chapter 1, Section 2. How Libertarian is Right Libertarian Theory? The short answer is not very. Liberty not only implies but also requires independent critical thought. Indeed, anarchists would argue that critical thought requires free development and evolution That's and that this is precisely which capitalist hierarchy crushes. For anarchists, a libertarian theory, if it is to be worthy of its name, must be based upon critical thought and reflect the key aspects that characterizes life, change, and the ability to evolve. To hold up dogma and base theory upon assumptions as opposed to facts is the opposite of a libertarian frame of mind. A libertarian theory must be based upon reality and recognize the need for change and the existence of change. Unfortunately, Right libertarianism is marked more by ideology than critical analysis. Right libertarianism and thus so-called anarcho-capitalists are characterized by a strong tendency of creating theories based upon assumptions and deductions from these axioms. For a discussion on the pre-scientific nature of this methodology and its dangers, see the next section. Robert Nozick, for example, in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, makes no attempts to provide a justification of the property rights his whole theory is based upon. His main assumption is that individuals have rights and there are certain things that no person or group may do to them without violating their rights. While this does have its intuitive appeal, it's not much to base a political ideology upon. After all, what rights people consider as valid can be pretty subjective and have constantly evolved during history. To say that individuals have rights is, open up to, is to open up to the question, what rights? Indeed, we will argue this in greater length in section two. Such a rights-based system as Nozick desires can and does lead to situations developing in which people consent to being exploited and oppressed that intuitively many people consider supporting the violation of these certain rights by creating other ones simply because of their evil consequences. In other words, starting from the assumption people have certain rights, Nozick constructs a theory which, when faced with the reality of unfreedom and domination, it would create for the many 
justifies this unfreedom as an expression of liberty. In other words, regardless of the outcome, the initial assumptions are what matter. Nozick's intuitive right system can lead to some very non-intuitive outcomes. And does Nozick prove the theory of property rights, he assumes? He states that, quote, we shall not formulate it here. Moreover, it's not formulated anywhere in his book. And if it's not formulated, what is there to defend? Surely this means that his libertarianism is without foundation. As Jonathan Wolf notes, Nozick's libertarian property rights remain substantially undefended. Given that the right to acquire property is critical to this entire theory, you would think it's important enough to go into some detail or at least document. After all, unless he provides us with a firm basis for property rights, then his entitlement theory is nonsense as no one has the right to private property. It could be argued that he doesn't present enough he does present enough information to allow us to piece together a possible argument in favor of property rights based on his modification of the Lockean proviso, although he does not point us to these arguments. However, assuming that this is the case, such a defense actually fails. If individuals do have rights, these rights do not include property rights in the form that Nozick and many other libertarians and anarcho-capitalists assume and don't prove. Nozick appears initially convincing because what he assumes with regards to property is a normal feature in the society we're in. We'd, we would be given what we note here that, Feeble's argue, uh, that feeble arguments pass for convincing when they're on the same side as a prevailing sentiment. Similarly, both Murray Rothbard and Ayn Rand who is famous for repeating A is A ad infinitum, do the same, base their ideologies on assumptions. You'll see more of this in section 11. Therefore, we see that most of the leading right libertarian ideologues base themselves on assumptions about what man or uh, man is or the rights they should have, usually in the form that people have certain rights because they're people. From these theorems and assumptions, they build their respective ideologies using logic to deduce the conclusions that their assumptions imply. Such a methodology is unscientific and indeed a relic of religious and pre-scientific society, but more importantly, can have negative effects on maximizing liberty. This is because methodology has distinct problems. Murray Roth, uh, I'm sorry, Murray Bookchin argues, quote, conventional reason rests on identity, not change. Its fundamental principle is that A equals A, the famous principle of identity, which means that any given phenomenon can be only itself and cannot be other than what we immediately perceive it to be at a given moment in time. It does not address the problem of change. A human being is an inf infant at one time, a child at another, an adolescent at still another, and finally a youth and then an adult. When we analyze an infant by the means of conventional reason, we're not exploring what it is becoming in the process of developing into a child. In other words, right libertarian and anarcho-capitalist theory is based upon ignoring the fundamental aspects of life, namely change and evolution. Perhaps it will be argued that identity also accounts for change by including potentiality, which means that we have the strange situation that A can potentially be A. If A is not actually A, but only has the potential to be A, then A is not A. Thus, to include change is to acknowledge that A does not equal A, that individuals and humanity evolves, and so what constitutes A changes. To maintain identity and then to deny it seems strange at the very least. That change is far from the A is A mentality can be seen from Rothbard, who goes so far as to state that, quote, one of the notable attributes of natural law is its applicability to all men, regardless of time or place. Thus, ethical law takes its place alongside physical or scientific natural laws. See the Ethics of Liberty, page 42, if you want this citation. Apparently, the nature of man is the only living thing in nature that does not evolve or change, according to Rothbard. Of course, 
it could be argued that by natural law, Rothbard is only referring to his method of deducing his, and we stress they are just his, not natural ethical laws. But his methodology starts by assuming certain things about man. Whether these assumptions seem far or not is beside the point. By using the term natural law, Rothbard is arguing that any actions that violate his ethical laws are somehow against nature. But if they were against nature, they could not occur. We'll discuss this more in section 11. Deductions from assumptions is a Procrustean bed for humanity, as Rothbard ideology shows. So, as can be seen, many leading right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists place great store on the axiom A is A, or that man has certain rights simply because he is man. As Bookchin points out, such conventional reason doubtlessly plays an indispensable role in mathematical thinking and mathematical sciences and in the nuts and bolts of dealing with everyday life, and so is essential to understand or design mechanical entities. But the question arises, is such reason useful when considering people and other forms of life? Mechanical entities are but one small aspect of human life. Unfortunately for these people, and unfortunately for the rest of humanity, they do believe this, but human beings are not mechanical entities. They're living, breathing, feeling, hoping, dreaming, changing, living organisms. They're not mechanical entities, and any theory that uses reason based on such non-living entities will flounder when faced with living ones. In other words... This theory treats people as the capitalist system tries to, namely as commodities, as things, instead of human beings whose ideas, ideals, and ethics change, develop, grow. Capitalism and capitalist ideologues try to reduce human life to the level of corn or iron by emphasizing the unchanging nature of man and their starting assumptions and rights. This can be seen from their support for wage labor, the reduction of human activity to a commodity on the market. While paying lip service to liberty and life, right libertarianism justifies the commodification of labor and life, which within a system of capitalist property rights can result in the treating of people as a means to an end in... uh, (laughs) treating people as a means to an end as opposed to an end in themselves. As Bookchin points out, quote, in an age of sharply conflicting values and emotionally charged ideals, such a way of reasoning is often repellent. Dogmatism, authoritarianism, and fear seem all pervasive. This ideology provides more than enough evidence for Bookchin's summary with its support for authoritarian social relationships, hierarchy, and even slavery. This mechanical viewpoint is also reflected in their lack of appreciation that social institutions and relationships evolve over time and sometimes fundamentally change. This can be best seen from property. Right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists fail to see that over time, in the words of Proudhon, property changed its nature. Originally, The word property was synonymous with individual possession, but it became more complex and turned into private property, the right to use uh, use it by his neighbor's labor. The changing of use rights to capitalist property rights created relations of domination and exploitation between people absent before. For the right libertarian and and so-called anarcho-capitalists, both The tools of the self-employed artisan and the capital of a transnational corporation are both forms of property, and so basically identical. In practice, of course, the social relations they create and the impact they have on society are totally different. Thus, the mechanical mindset of right libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism fails to understand how institutions like property evolve and come to replace whatever freedom-enhancing features they had with oppression. Indeed, von Mises argues 
that there may be possibly a difference of opinion about whether a particular institution is socially beneficial or harmful. But once it has been judged by whom we ask beneficial, one can no longer contend that for some explicable reason it must be condemned as immoral. Liberalism, page 34. So much for evolution and change. Anarchism, in contrast, is based upon the importance of critical thought, informed by an awareness that life is in a constant process of change. This means that our ideas on human society must be informed by the facts, not by what we wish was true. For Bookchin, an evaluational of convention, uh, conventional wisdom, as expressed in the law of identity, is essential. And its conclusions have, quote, enormous importance for how we behave as ethical beings, the nature of nature, and our place in the natural world. Moreover, these issues directly affect the kind of society, sensibility, and life ways we wish to foster. Bookchin is correct. While anarchists oppose hierarchy in the name of liberty, right libertarians and these so-called anarcho-capitalists support authority and hierarchy all of which deny freedom and restrict individual development. It is un this is unsurprising because the right libertarian ideology rejects change in critical thought based upon scientific method and is so is fundamentally anti-life in its assumptions and anti-human in its methods. Far from being an actually libertarian set of ideas, these right libertarian ideas are a mechanical set of dogmas that deny the fundamental nature of life, namely change, and of individuality, namely critical thought and freedom. Moreover, in practice, their system of capitalist rights would soon result in extensive restrictions on liberty and authoritarian social relationships. We'll cover that more in section two and three. A strange result of a theory proclaiming itself libertarian but one consistent with its methodology. From a wider viewpoint, such a rejection of liberty by right libertarians is unsurprising. They do, after all, support capitalism. Capitalism produces an inverted set of ethics, one in which capital, dead labor, is more important than people, living labor. After all, workers are usually easier to replace than investments in capital. And the person who owns capital commands the person who only owns his life and productive abilities. As Oscar Wilde noted, crimes against property are the crimes that the English law, valuing what a man has more than what a man is, punishes with the hardest and most horrible severity. This mentality is reflected in right libertarianism when it claims that stealing food is a crime while starving to death due to the action of market forces, power, and property rights is no infringement upon your rights. It can be seen when right libertarians claim that, tax, that the taxation of earnings from labor, examples of one dollar from a millionaire, is on par with forced labor. You can see Nozick for that citation while working in a sweatshop for 14 hours a day, enriching said millionaire does not affect your liberty as you consent to it due to market forces. Although, of course, many rich people have earned their money without, lab uh, without laboring themselves, um, their earnings derive from the wage labor of others. So would taxing those non-labor earnings be forced labor? Interestingly, the individualist anarchist Ben Tucker argues that an income tax was a recognition of the fact that industrial freedom and equality of opportunity no longer exist here in the U.S. in the 1890s, even in the imperfect state in which they once did. Which somewhat suggests a different viewpoint on this matter than Nozick or Rothbard would put forth. That capitalism produces an inverted set of ethics can be seen when the Ford produced the Pinto. The Pinto had a flaw in it, which meant that if it was hit in a certain way in a crash, the fuel tank exploded. The Ford company decided it was more economically viable to produce that car and pay damages to those who were injured or the relatives of those who died than to pay to change the invested capital. The needs for the owners of capital to make a profit came before the needs of the living. Similarly, 
bosses often hire people to perform unsafe work in dangerous conditions and fire them if they protest. Right libertarian and by extension so-called anarcho-capitalist ideology is the philosophical equivalent. Its dogma is capital and it comes before life, labor. As Bakunin once put it, you will always find the idealists in the very act of practical materialism while you will see the materialists pursuing and realizing the most grandly ideal aspirations and thoughts. Hence, we see right libertarians supporting sweatshops and opposing taxation. For in the end, money and the power that goes with it counts far more in that ideology than ideals such as liberty, individual dignity, empowerment, creative and productive work, and so on and so forth for all. The central flaw of right libertarianism and by extension so-called anarcho-capitalists is that it does not recognize that the workings of the capitalist market can easily ensure that the majority end up becoming a resource for others in ways far worse than that associated with taxation. The legal rights of self-ownership supported by right libertarians does not mean that people have the ability to avoid what is in effect enslavement to another. Right libertarian theory is not based upon a libertarian methodology or perspective, and so it's hardly surprising it suppo- uh, in, in results it supports authoritarian social relationships, and indeed, at the end of the day, slavery. All right, there's section 1.2 done. Um, Anarchist161, thank you for the follow. Whoever complimented me on my reading voice, thank you for that as well. I saw that go by. Um, Sorry I didn't address it right away. I'm just trying to do a thing, and we're just trying to get some stuff done here. Um, I don't know what the next, how long the next section is. If it's short, we might, we might do it. If it's long, I don't know. Hmm. It's long as fuck. Um, all right, cool. That's two clips down. Um, all right. Uh, all right, let's take a break from that. I, like I said, I, I'm just going to put all of these into a playlist and it's just going to go up on the YouTube channel and fucking, there you go. It's just going to all be there. It'll be, it'll be a few hours at least, at least I'm guessing it'll probably be something in the neighborhood of nine to 15 hours, something in there. Yeah. Cause that, that first, the, the, the appendix, the prefix, um, and just the first 1.0 chapter section uh, are 45 minutes. So, yeah, well, yeah, peace. It's going to be a fucking thing. It's going to be a while before I get this done. Yeah, I guess. Like, I, you know, yeah, it's going to be a while before I get this done. But it needs doing. It needs doing. Oh, all right. I'll go over that. I mark that as. Oh. Oh, and the first one's very smarmy. Like right, like that one. I was literally doing Kai's reading voice, right? Like that was me sort of doing the the vocal training and I was, you know, I was over and reflecting and fucking doing the thing, right? Right? Like I was all over, like I was doing it. The first one is me being a smarmy fuck, right? Like it, it is very literally and sometimes I'm speed reading it. So that first section is going to be like kind of a pain in the ass to listen to probably. But... <clears throat> What does, uh, oh God, let me just check something really quickly here. 
Okay, so chapter one has four sections to it. Chapter two has eight sections. Chapter three has two sections. Chapter four has five sections. Uh, chapter five is just one section. Will privatizing the commons increase liberty? Chapter six has five sections. Um, actually, let me check something. Oh, no. Okay, so I have to increase one. I have to, so chapter one has five sections. Chapter two has nine sections. Chapter three has three sections. Chapter four has six sections. Chapter five has one section. Chapter six has six sections. Chapter seven um, has four sections. Chapter eight has eight sections. Chapter nine has one section. Chapter 10 has four sections. Chapter 11 has seven sections. Um, yeah, Caster, it basically, it's going into a YouTube playlist, um, because basically I, I have to fight with these assholes who call, claim to be anarchists on a regular basis. These fucking so-called anarcho-capitalists, these wannabe fucking neo neo uh, neo-feudalists, and I'm fucking sick of it. And I have my own arguments. I do them all the time. But the Anarchist FAQ has this amazing document that is extensive and addresses everything, basically. Like, all of their bullshit talking points. Like, all of them. At distance, at length. Scope and scale is ridiculous. And a lot of people don't like to read. So I'm reading it on stream and I've got what's, it's called Make Echoes. Um, and basically I can just press a record button and that gets kicked out to a video. And then I will have a YouTube playlist at the end and I will have it sectioned out. Um, they, I don't know if they're, um, let me check. Let me check if they're taking people again, Frackle. They they were they only wanted a, a, a hundred streamers. Um, it looks like they've opened it back up again. So, oh, it's costing more now. It's costing more. I got the good deal. Holy shit, Frackle! It's not, it's fifty bucks a month. I got I got the OG deal. Like I got the we're we're doing a test run. Will a hundred streamers please help us with this technology cost? Um I would not pay fifty bucks a month for this. But yeah, it's um it's integrated here. Let me try and get it on camera for you, Frackle. All right. Here's here's my make echo bucket buttons. 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, or just start and stop recording. So like I can literally tell it the last 90 seconds, dump that into a video clip for me. Right. Or you can just set it to record and then it pumps it out to it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's useful, but not for 50 bucks a fucking month. I, you know what? I like my stream deck astral. I like my stream deck. I, I legitimately like my stream deck. Like, I mean, right? Like I, I'm, I'm a fan. <laughs> It, it does it does everything for me. Um, yeah. My 3D printing stuff is connected to it. My um, my sound effect, like the, the soundboard is connected to it. All the recording stuff. Like I push a button and everything launches for the stream. The lights come on. Like here. You ready? Right, like that's... Like, the lighting is connected to it. Like, everything turns on. Fucking uh, the push of a button. Um, yeah, accidentally end stream. I do not have a button for that. I could. Um, it is, Astral. A lot of it is software. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I could. Um, but that armored? No. That's... 
I don't do the stream start, stream stop connected to Stream Deck. That I manually do. For those very reasons. Uh, but yeah, like, I, and not just the lights turning on and off. The lights actually are like, here, you ready? Um, The, the lights, temperature and um, brightness are both controllable remotely. So I can cool the lights, I can warm the lights, I can brighten them, I can dim them. They're all controllable from there as well, up to and including their power source. They get very, very bright. Yes. The, the, the light that you see right now, which is fucking bright as shit, right? I wish I could show you like exactly how bright these fuckers are. Adia has seen it. Cat has seen it. They're fucking bright as shit, right? They're on 6% right now. All right. If I turn them up to a hundred in this room, this room is just, but you will see, you will see the light outside hundred percent. Yeah. They're on 6% right now. Absolutely fucking ridiculous. Yeah, they're good key lights. They're good fucking key lights. Um, so, yeah, and they're that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know if I can... See if I can get you guys... Oh, you know what? I've shown it before here. Um, saw it for 15 minutes. I'm totally going for make echoes. I, You know, go for it, Frackle. Admin for show use. Paste, and there you go. All right, there. <clears throat> right? No, you just get blown out at a certain point, Crix. Um, for show use. And here you guys go. Right. Oh, I'm sorry, Astral. And so that's that's the forward view, right? Here's the side view, right? So you can see the mic, the boom arm, the mixing gear. You can see the, the, the monitors and that sort of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, there's the DSLR. Hi. Um, and then there's the side cam. Right here. So. Yeah, that's, that's the setup. Beastical, I worked in technology my entire life. This, this is literally nothing to me. It's just... Oh, and what you can't see is there's a tablet over here. Um, right here. Let's see if I can... And then my Kai's t so Kai's tech tips when uh fucking yeah no, um but you know I've done operational security like for the activists sort of shit before you know there's a 
that 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 segment is on YouTube. Like it's literally its own separate video. Um, and then yeah, my desk is it, it literally like it's it's uh, all of this. <laughs> um, use a gooseneck instead of a boom arm. I use um here. It's a Yellow Tech Mika. It's a it, it's look. It's a it's a four hundred dollar mic arm. I'm not gonna fucking blow smoke up your ass. It's a it's a four hundred dollar mic arm. Yeah, the mic arm costs as much as the fucking s a, a little less than the ro, uh, the the Shure SM7B microphone, which is legitimately one of the best microphones. Right, like the mic arm doubles the cost. So, it, it, but if you see the distance, it's mounted all the way fucking back there, right? Like this thing is, this thing is fucking long and it, it holds its place wherever I fucking put it, it stays. Uh, well, congratulations, Frackle. And if you have a stream deck... It plugs right into it. You won't even have to worry with it. And Frackle, there's commands that your mods can use. Yellow Tech Mika. It's it's actually M exclamation mark K A. But Yellow Tech Y E L L O W T E C. The German manufacturer. Um, they make professional studio gear. Like, that's what they do. Like, uh, radio studios and stuff like that. That's what they make them for. This is not a microphone for a fucking podcaster or, like, a YouTuber. This is a microphone arm. This is a boom arm for, like, a, a radio station or a television station. Like, that's that's who they make these for. Um, nice, Astro. Um... No, actually, I don't have an Apple stand. I have fucking... I don't know what I have, but it's a good stand. Um, and then my keyboard for my tablet is a little Logitech. Um, my keyboard for the computer is a Logitech K800. Um, and then I, you know, I like uh, Logitech MX uh, uh, Master first generation. The third generation they make now is shit. Don't buy it. Um... Rock on, Frackle. If it works for what you do and what you want, yeah. Uh, your mic was on sale in Germany for 250 euros. I was so tempted. What's what's that in, like, freedom units? Three. That's less than 300 bucks. Viva, you should have snapped that the fuck up. I'd fucking buy another one for less than $300. I don't even have a need for it. But if I saw this mic on sale for less than $300, I'd fucking buy it. Yeah. Um, somebody asked me a question. Mind if I ask what brought you to Vegas? Um, came here years ago. I came here. I followed family. I came here with family years and years and years ago now. Um... And this isn't the only thing. You're going to need a cloud lifter. If you have an SM7B, you're going to need a cloud lifter. You're, you're going you're gonna to need something to actually get some... Uh, some you're going to need something to put some gain on this mic. This is a gain-hungry microphone. And you can't do it all on your mixer. So, yeah. And that is a uh, Rode Procaster board. Fair enough, Viva. Um, which I adore. I love this thing. It's great. It's fucking great. Uh, if you're going to be a, a podcaster, um, it's fucking brilliant. If you're, you know, whatever. Here. Fucking things up, making everything shitty. It's profiles and shit fuckery. All right. You can put an you can put a SD card in the back of it. Literally take it to a fucking thing. Um, it's got four different outputs um, for headphones. 
It's actually got five. It's got a master mix down as well. Um, so you can put four XLR inputs into that Procaster. You can get four headphone outputs from it. So everybody in the room who has a microphone can get an output from it independently so they can hear their levels independently. It's got a bi-directional USB-C out on it. So it's literally looped into my computer. Um, it's got a 3.5 millimeter like standard audio jack out. It's got Bluetooth. And then of course it's got the sound boards that you can upload and program and customize. So you can record directly on that thing, multi-channel recording if you wanted. Um, at fucking Gemma. Yeah. I, I prefer sure microphones. But Rode makes solid gear. Um, Rode's um, interview microphone for field work is brilliant. The, the, the sound deadening on like wind and external noise for the directionality of it is, oh, it's amazing. Like, the, yeah, the newscaster's microphone that Rode makes, if you were ever going to do a field interview, I would use that microphone. It's amazing. Yeah, Rode makes really good, but for this sort of thing, for, you know, vocal dynamics and up-close speaking that I do like this, the Shure SM7B is about as good as you can get, short of buying that goddamn fucking $4,000 microphone. And if you know who I'm talking about, if you know your microphones, you know which mic I'm talking about. Yeah, Chris, it's, it cracks, it's, you know, it's, it's a great microphone. Here, I'll I emphasize that one, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's to hell of a microphone. Um, and so, yeah, I, that's, that's basically the gear. Oh, and I use a Canon uh, DSLR. Um, and um, Klipsch studio monitor speakers. If you want to know what studio monitor speakers I use, even though when I'm on the air, I use headphones. Um, oh, and I use, um, DT770 studios if I'm doing, um, studio like record, uh, recording and that sort of thing. Oh, sorry, Gemma. Yeah, yeah, it's a Newman. Yeah. And you want to know why every PBS broadcast, every PBS radio broadcast in the U.S. sounds exactly the same? They all use Newman mics. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I think I think they use, I don't know which one they use. I think, oh God, they may use the, um, I don't know if they use the TLM 102 or the 103. I forget which ones they use. Um, no, 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 not the TLMs. Um, they use the, the oh, fuck, they use the other one. Um, but yeah, yeah, they're Newmans. Um, if I would stream, I actually could have an, uh, if I would stream, I actually could have a nice setup that wouldn't require a green screen because I'd have my $2,000 projector running or 2,000 euro projector running. I've considered doing projection mapping behind me because projection mapping is fun. Um, but I decided not to spend the money on the projection mapper uh, on the projection uh, projector and then the, the automated projection mapping kit because I'm not going to do by hand projection mapping. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all of my tech that matters for the purposes of this. Um, my the the fucking mounting pole for all this shit though is uh... yeah it's six feet tall like there's a there's a th 
fucking black rod that six feet tall out the back. Yeah, I don't like green screens. I've tried to work with them. I hate them. <laughs> it's okay, Duchess. I get it. Um, I, I, I am, I know like a lot of streamers and podcasters use the SM7B because mainly aesthetics, right? The, this is a good profile. It's a good profile, right? It, this, this microphone is sexy looking, not going to deny. I chose it because one, I'm an audio file to start with. This microphone recreates my vocal range perfectly. Cat, cat, we've talked about this. Cat has, cat has gone on the record for this. The version of me you hear over the microphone is the version of me that you would hear in person. It replicates my vocal qualities spot on. So as far as I'm concerned, isn't that what you want from a microphone? <laughs> Right? Like that's that's exactly what I fucking wanted was something that can convey the nuances and the tonalities and the intonations and the weird things I sometimes do with my voice. Proximity effect for male voices makes reproduction really nice. It does. Oops. Closed a tab I didn't mean to. Fair enough, Astral. Uh, yeah, yeah. Fair enough, Gemma. Fair enough. Um. Oh, and the uh, the processing the the processing that happens on the the Procaster, very good onboard processing. Just gonna say, very good on onboard processing. Um. I need, a, I need a mic that makes my voice sound sexy. Um, all right. Dare I try and get another another section of this goddamn document in? <sighs> all right. Oh, didn't mean to click that. Oh, that's so long. It's so long. What is four? How long is four? Four is so long. To, oh my God. Four is so long. Oh, this document is huge, y'all. This document is just fucking huge. <sighs> um, be, <laughs> Frackle. Thank you kindly. Um, Um, Mr. Robotson, thank you for the, uh, thank you for the follow. Um, who got him? Billy Club and Neander, Neander, uh, Netherlad, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, Frackle, thank you for that. Um, I know you would, y'all would listen, but it's a matter of whether I fucking feel like doing it. It's so fucking long. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, all right, where is it? There it is. All right, y'all. Somebody keep this link copy and pasted just in case, or uh, copied, just in case somebody comes into chat. I don't want to lose my place again. <clears throat> so if somebody comes into chat and asks for what the fuck I'm reading, somebody feel free to paste that for me, please, and thank you. Oh. And while we're at it, Um, there we go. While I'm doing this, you're going to do the thing. There we go. Um, okay, cool. So follows, 
disable subscriptions, disable, and biddies I use also disable. All right, so follows. Let's see if we can test it. Still does it, but okay. So hopefully it won't do it. All right. Here we go. One last section, y'all, and then I think we may actually call it an early, a relatively early night. Um, I kind of I was up too late anyway yesterday, and tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's bad movie night, um, so we're gonna we're gonna be up all night anyway. Oh yeah, Burger, it's gonna be a fucking thing. I trust me. But thank you for reminding me, Burger. Um, hey, tomorrow's bad movie night. We still have to figure out what the fuck we're gonna watch. I have no idea what we're gonna watch, um, but. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, like, we'll be up late tomorrow night with each other anyway. So, yeah, I think I may do this reading and then fucking, okay, so, all right. Um, real talk, the, the Prince Albert has gotten to the place where it is completely like, it's not a thing to hit it, to pull on it, right? Like it's, I can, I can, with it, right? It is so weird to like adjust yourself, right? And you fucking, it flops on you like your leg or something. Cause I've got my, my feet crossed right now and on your fucking ankle, right? Like thunk, right? There's a piece of fucking metal that hits your ankle. All of a sudden you're like, it, it's an interesting thing, right? It's an interesting thing to have a piece of fucking metal, like flapping around down in that part of the world. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I hope you do do I, you do as well, Rumble. I, I I love Bad Movie Night. I look forward to Bad Movie Night all week now. Like legitimately, I'm glad it's something we started as a community. It is a highlight of my week, hanging out with like 20 people on fucking Discord and just fucking shitting on bad movies while we all get fucked up. Uh, yeah, Viva. I plan on stretching it. I want a bigger gauge. Um, I'm at eight right now. I want to do a six, at least at least a six gauge. Um, so I, that's, yeah, like I plan on getting a bigger piece of metal down there as well. <laughs> Fucking so eventually it will be, I mean, there's going to be a little bit of weight there. Um, Aspen, I'm excited for another bad movie night. Dude, it's dude, we, we, and we theme it sometimes and we do all sorts of stuff. Some bad movies aren't for everybody. Someone, sometimes you're just bored. Other times you're fucking laughing your ass off the whole way through. Um, yep. Yeah. I have beasticle. I have. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm gonna keep gauging up on it for at least one more gauge, if not maybe two, we'll see six, four, six, four is where I'm, I'm looking at, but yeah, for certain reasons, it's got to go at least to a six. We won't talk about those reasons. Um, Breen is so far the only universally liked bad movie. Breen, it's because Breen is a goddamn genius. Breen is, there's a reason he is the, he is the mascot for Bad Movie Night. He is the lord and savior of Bad Movie Night. Neil Breen is the god of Bad Movie Night. Yes, master of badness. Uh, will it pull your thing like the Asian guys who hang weights on it to make it longer? I, not with that, not with the amount of weight that it has, Viva. Um, it's niobium. It's the metal. Viva, you're, you're into these sorts of things. The metal is niobium. Um, so it's, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, dude, if it wasn't TOS, I'd, I'd probably just show you guys on stream, like straight up. I'd be like, here you go. Like I'd stand up and fucking show you like it to me, it's nothing. And I've got an exhibitionist streak anyway. Like it wouldn't be, it literally wouldn't mean anything to me to show that off, but it's a whole fucking thing. Right. So, um, all right, let's try and, oh, this is going to be a thing. Link to only fans. Yeah, I know. Right. Um, astral. I have not, um, just because the, the only reason I didn't show it did somebody has seen it. Somebody has seen it. I'm just going to leave it at that. I will not address your guesses. I will not address your questions. Somebody has seen it. So, 
So let's get to reading. Um, all right. Oh. I sure you know what? Let me stand up and fucking get a little blood flowing first. <laughs> Oh, is Zartos one of the few that's seen me without a shirt on? Is Zartos, Zartos, are you one of the few people that's seen the the fucking ripped six, like six, eight pack version of Kai? Were you, were you, you were in on that call? Yeah. So, yeah, Zartos has seen like, okay, so Zartos is one of the few that's seen that. Um, yeah, fucking Kai used to have an eight pack, like fucking sh- shredded. So, yeah, uh, Mitre's seen it, Kat has seen it, Zartos has seen it, oh, uh, Christina's seen it, um, yeah, few people have seen that photo. All right. Oh, this is a fucking thing, this is gonna be a while. Dude, you guys, this is gonna strap in, this is gonna be like 25, 30 minutes probably. Chapter 1, Section 3. Is right libertarian theory scientific in nature? Usually no. The scientific approach is inductive. Much of the right libertarian approach is deductive. The first draws generalizations from the data, and the second applies preconceived generalizations to the data. A completely deductive approach is pre-scientific, however, which is why many right libertarians can't legitimately claim to use a scientific method. Deduction does occur in science, but the generalizations are primarily based on other data, not a priori assumptions, and are checked against data to see if they're accurate. Anarchists tend to fall into the inductive camp, as Kropotkin put it. Precisely this natural scientific method applied to economic facts enables us to prove the so-called laws of middle-class sociology, including also their political economy, are not laws at all, but simply guesses or mere assertions which have never been verified at all. See Kropotkin's Revolutionary Pamphlets, page 153 for that quote. The idea that natural scientific methods can be applied to economic and social life is one that many right libertarians reject. Instead, they favor the deductive or pre-scientific approach. This, we must note, is not purely limited to Austrian economists. Many more mainstream capitalist economists also embrace the deduction over induction methodology. The tendency for right libertarianism to fall into dogmatism, or a priori theorems as they call it, and its implications can be best seen from the work of Ludwig von Mises and other economists from the right libertarian Austrian school. Of course, not all right libertarians necessarily subscribe to this approach. Rothbard, for one, did. But its use by so many leading lights of both schools of thoughts is significant and worthy of comment. And We are concentrating on methodology. It's not essential to discuss the starting assumptions. The assumptions, such as, to use Rothbard's words, the Austrians' fundamental axiom that individual human act, uh, sorry, fundamental axiom that individual human beings act may be correct, incorrect, or incomplete, but the method of using them advocated by von Mises ensures that such considerations are irrelevant. Von Mises a leading member of the Austrian School of Economics, begins by noting that social and economic theory is not derived from experience. It is prior to experience, which is back to front. It's obvious that experience of capitalism is necessary in order to develop a viable theory about how it works. Without the experience, any theory is just a flight of fantasy. The actual specific theory we develop is therefore derived from experience, informed by it, and will have to get checked against reality to see if it's viable. 
This is the scientific method. Any theory must be checked against the facts. However, von, v uh, however, von Mises goes on to argue at length that no kind of experience can ever force us to discard or modify a priori theorems. They are logically prior to it and cannot be proved or corroborative experience or disproved by experience to the contrary. And if this does not do justice to a full exposition of the phantasmagoria of von Mises' a priorism, the reader may take some joy, or horror, from the following statement. Quote, If a contradiction appears between a theory and experience, we must always assume that a condition presupposed by the theory was not present, or else there is some error in our observation. The disagreement between the theory and the facts of experience frequently forces us to think through the problems of the theory again. But so long as the th rethinking of the theory uncovers no errors in our thinking, we are not entitled to doubt its truth. This is Homa Kat uh, Katsoian. Um, in other words, if reality is in conflict with your ideas... Do not adjust your views because reality must be at fault. The scientific method would be, uh, would be to revise the theory in light of facts. It is not scientific to reject the facts in light of theory. This anti-scientific perspective is at the heart of his economics as experience, quote, can never prove or disprove any particular theorem. Quote, what assigns economics to its peculiar and unique position in the orbit of pure knowledge and of the practical utilization of knowledge is the fact that its particular theorems are not open to any verification or falsification on the grounds of experience. The ultimate yardstick of an economic, economic theorem's correctness or incorrectness is solely reason unaided by experience. Von Mises rejects the scientific approach, as do all Austrian economists. Murray Rothbard states approvingly that Mises indeed held not only that economic theory does not need to be tested by historical fact, but also that it cannot be so tested. See Praxeology, the Methodology of Austrian Economics in The Foundation of Modern Austrian Economics, page 32. Similarly, von Hayek wrote that the economic theories, quote, can never be verified or falsified by reference to facts. All that we can and must verify is the presence of our assumptions in that particular case. Individuals and, uh, individualism and economic order, page 73. This may be seen somewhat strange to non-Austrians. How can we ignore reality when deciding whether a theory is a good one or not? If we cannot evaluate ideas, how can we consider them anything but dogma? The Austrians maintain that we cannot use historical evidence because every historical situation is unique. Thus, we cannot use complex, heterogeneous th historical facts as, they were, uh, as if they were repeatable, homogeneous facts. Like those in a scientific experiment. Rothbard. While such a position does have an element of truth about it, it, the extreme a priorism that is drawn from this element is radically false, just as extreme empiricism is also false, but for entirely different reasons. Those who hold such a position ensure that their ideas cannot be evaluated beyond logical analysis. As Rothbard makes clear, since praxeology begins with a true axiom, A, all that can be deduced from this axiom must also be true. For if A implies B and A is true, then B must also be true. But such an approach makes the search for truth a game without rules. The Austrian economists and other right libertarians and thus pseudo-anarcho-capitalists who use this approach are free to theorize anything they want without such irritating constrictions as facts, statistics, data, history, or experimental confirmation, of course. Their only guide is logic, 
But this is no different from what religions do when they assert the logical existence of God. Theories ungrounded in fact and data are easily spun into any belief a person wants. Starting assumptions and trains of logic may contain inaccuracy so small as to be undetectable, yet will yield entirely false conclusions. In addition, trains of logic may miss things which are only brought to light by actual experience. After all, the human mind is not all-knowing or all-seeing. To ignore actual experience is to lose that input when evaluating a theory. Hence, our comments on the irrelevance of the assumptions used, the methodology is such that incomplete or incorrect assumptions or steps cannot be identified in light of experience. This is because one way of discovering if a given chain of logic requires checking is to test its conclusions against available evidence, although von Mises did argue that the ultimate yardstick was solely reason unaided by experience. If we do take that experience into account and rethink a given theory in light of contradictory evidence, the problem remains that a given logical chain may be correct but incomplete or concentrate on or stress inappropriate factors. In other words, our logical deductions may be correct, but our starting place or steps wrong. As the facts are to be rejected in the light of the deductive method, we cannot revise our ideas. Indeed, this approach could result in discarding certain forms of human behavior as irrelevant, which the Austrian system claims uses, using empirical evidence does. For there are too many variables that can have an influence upon individual acts to yield conclusive results explaining human behavior. Indeed, the deductive approach may ignore as irrelevant certain human motiva motivations which have a decisive impact on an outcome. There could be a strong tendency to project right libertarian person onto the rest of society and history, for example, and draw inappropriate insights into the way human society works or has worked. This can be seen, for example, in an attempt to claim pre-capitalist societies as examples of so-called anarcho-capitalism in action. You see this regularly with these so-called ANCAPs making claims to market systems as capitalism. Moreover, Deductive reasoning cannot indicate the relative significance of assumptions or theoretical factors. That requires empirical study. It could be that a factor considered important in the theory actually turns out to have little effect in practice. And so the derived axioms are so weak as to be seriously misleading. In such a purely ideal realm, Observation and experience are distrusted when not ignored, and instead theory becomes the lodestone. Given the bias of most theorists in this tradition, it is, it is unsurprising that this style of economics it is unsurprising that this style of economics can always be trusted to produce results proving free markets to be the finest principle of social organization. And, as an added bonus, reality can be ignored as it is never pure enough according to the assumptions required by the theory. It could be argued because of this that many right libertarians insulate their theories from criticism by refusing to test them or acknowledge the results of such testing. Indeed, it could be argued that much of right libertarianism is more religion than a political theory as it's set up in such a way that it is either true or false, with this being uh, determined not by evaluating facts but by whether you accept the assumptions and logical chains presented with them. Strangely enough, while dismissing the testability of theories, many right libertarians, including Rothbard, do investigate historical situations and then claim them as examples of how well their ideas work in practice. But why does historical fact suddenly become useful when it can be used to bolster the right libertarian argument? Any such example is just as complex as any other, and the good results indicated may not be accountable to the assumptions and steps of the theory, but to other factors totally ignored by it. 
If economic or other theory is untestable, then no conclusions can be drawn from history, including claims for the superiority of laissez-faire capitalism. You cannot have it both ways. Although we do doubt that right libertarians will stop using history as evidence that their ideas work. Perhaps the Austrian desire to investigate history is not so strange at all. Clashes with reality make a priori deductive systems implode as the falsifications run back up the deductive changes to shatter the structure built upon the original axioms. Thus, the desire to find some examples which prove their ideology must be tremendous. However, the deductive a priori methodology makes them unwilling to admit to being mistaken. Hence, their attempts to downplay examples which refute their dogmas. Thus, we have the desire for historical examples, while at the same time, they have extensive ideological justifications that ensure reality only enters their worldview when it agrees with them. In practice, the latter wins as real life refuses to be boxed into their dogmas and deductions. Of course, it is sometimes argued that it is complex data that is the problem. Let us assume that this is the case. It is argued that when dealing with the complex information, it is impossible to use aggregate data without first having more simple assumptions, i.e. that humans act. Due to the complexity of the situation, it is argued it is impossible to aggregate data because it, this hides the individual activities that it creates. Thus, complex data cannot be used to invalidate assumptions or theories. Hence, according to Austrians, the axioms derived from the simple facts that humans act are the only basis for thinking about the economy. Such a position is false in two ways. Firstly, the aggregation of data does allow us to understand complex systems. If we look at a chair, we cannot find out whether it is comfortable, its color, whether... It is soft or hard by looking at the atoms that make it up. To suggest that you can is to imply the existence of green, soft, and comfortable atoms. Similarly with gases. They're composed to countless individual atoms, but scientists don't study them by looking at those atoms and their actions. Within systems, this is also valid for human action. For example, it would be crazy to maintain from historical data that interest rates will be a certain percentage a week, but it is valid to maintain that interest rates are known to be related to certain variables in certain ways, or that certain experiences will tend to result in certain forms of psychological damage. General tendencies and rules of thumb can be evolved from each study, and these can be used to guide current practice and theory. By aggregating data, you can produce valid information, rules of thumb, theories, and evidence, which would be lost if you concentrate on simple data such as humans act. Therefore, empirical study produces facts which vary across time and place, and yet underlying and important patterns can be generated, patterns which can be evaluated against new data and improved upon. Secondly, the simple actions themselves influence and are influenced in turn by overall complex facts. People act in different ways in different circumstances, something we can agree with Austrians about, although we refuse to take it to their extreme position of rejecting empirical evidence as such. To use simple acts to understand complex system means to miss the fact that these acts are not independent of their circumstances. For example, to claim that the capitalist market is just, the resultant of bilateral exchanges ignores the fact that the market activity shapes the nature and form of these bilateral exchanges. The simple data is dependent on the complex system, and so the complex system cannot be understood by looking at the simple actions in isolation. To do so would be to draw incomplete and misleading conclusions, and it is due to these interrelations that we argue that aggregate data should be used critically. This is particularly important when looking at capitalism, where the simple acts of exchange in the labor market are dependent upon and shaped by the circumstances outside these acts. So to claim that complex data cannot be used to evaluate a theory is false. Data can be useful when seeing whether a theory is confirmed by reality. This is the nature of the scientific method. You compare the results expected by your theory to the facts, and if they do not match, you check your facts 
and you check your theory. This may involve revising the assumptions, methodology, and theories you use if the evidence is such as to bring them into question. For example, if you claim that capitalism is based on freedom, but that the net result of capitalism is to produce relations of domination between people, then it would be valid to revise, for example, your definition of freedom rather than deny that domination restricts freedom. But if actual experience is to be distrusted when evaluating theory, we effectively place ideology above people. After all, how the ideology affects people in practice is irrelevant as experiences cannot be used to evaluate the logically sound but actually deeply flawed theory. Moreover, there is a slight arrogance in the Austrian dismissal of empirical evidence. If, as they argued, the economy is just too complex to allow us to generalize from experience, then how can one person comprehend it sufficiently to create an economic ideology as to the Austrians as the Austrians uh, suggest? Surely no one mind or series of minds can produce a model which accurately reflects such a complex system. To suggest that one can deduce a theory from an exceedingly complex social system, from the theoretical work based on an analysis technique which deliberately ignores that reality as being unreliable, seems to require a deliberate suspension of one's reasoning faculties. Of course, it may be argued that such a task is possible, given a small enough subset of economic activity. However, such a process is sure to lead its practitioners astray as the subset is not independent of the whole and consequently can be influenced in ways the ideologist does not, indeed cannot, take into account. Simply put, even the greatest mind cannot comprehend the complexity of real life, and so empirical evidence needs to inform any theory seeking to describe and explain it. To reject it is simply to retreat into dogmatism and ideology, which is precisely what right-wing libertarians generally do. Ultimately, this dismissal of empirical evidence seems little more than self-serving. Its utility to the ideologist is obvious. It allows them to speculate to their heart's content, building models of the economy which bear an, uh, with, with no bearing to reality. Their models and the conclusions it generates need never be bothered with reality, nor the effects of their dogma, which shows its utility to the powerful. It allows them to spout comments like the free market benefits all, while the rich get richer, and allows them to brush aside anyone who points out such troublesome facts. That this position is self-serving can, can be seen from the fact that most right libertarians are very selective about applying von Mises' argument. As a rule of thumb, it's only applied when the empirical evidence goes against capitalism. In such circumstances, the fact that the current system is not a free market will also be mentioned. However, if the evidence seems to bolster the case for propertarianism, then empirical evidence becomes all the rage. Remember, kids... That's not real capitalism. Needless to say, the fact that we do not have a free market will be conveniently forgotten. Depending on the needs of the moment, fundamental facts are dropped and retrieved to bolster their ideology. As we indicated in the previous section, and we'll discuss in more depth later, most of the leading right libertarian theorist base them, um, base themselves on such deductive methodology, starting from assumptions and logically drawing conclusions from them. The religious undertones of such methodology can be seen from the roots of right, a right libertarian natural law theory. Carol Pateman, in her analysis of liberal contract theory, indicates the religious nature of, of the natural law argument, so loved by the theorists of the radical right. She notes that for Locke, the main source of the libertarian right's natural law cult, natural law was equivalent of God's law, and that God's law exists eternally to and independently of individuals. If you would like to read more, you can read The Problem of Political Obligation, page 154 with Carol Bateman. No role for critical thought there, only obedience. Most modern-day natural law supporters forget to mention this religious undercurrent and instead talk about nature, 
or the market, as the deity that creates law, not God, in order to appear rational. So much for science. Such is a basis in dogma, and religion can hardly be a firm foundation for liberty and indeed natural law is marked by a deep authoritarianism. Locke's traditional view of natural law provided individuals with an external standard which they could recognize, but which they did not voluntarily choose to order their political life. In section 11, we'll discuss the authoritarian nature of natural law and will not do so here. However, here we must point out the political conclusions Locke draws from his ideas. In Pateman's words, Locke believed that, quote, obedience lasts only as long as protection. His individuals are able to take action themselves to remedy their political lot. But this does not mean, as is often assumed, that Locke's theory gives direct support to present-day arguments for a right of civil disobedience. His theory allows for two alternatives. Either people go peacefully about their daily affairs under the protection of a liberal constitutional government, or they are in revolt against a government which has ceased to be liberal and has become arbitrary and tyrannical, so forfeiting its right to obedience. Locke's rebellion exists purely to reform a new liberal government, not to change the existing socioeconomic structure which the liberal government exists to protect. His theory, therefore, indicates the results of a priorism, namely a denial of any form of social dissent which may change the natural law as defined by Locke. This perspective can be found in Rothbard, who lambasted the individual anarchists for arguing that juries should judge the law as well as the facts. For Rothbard, the law would be drawn up by jurists and lawyers, not ordinary people. The idea that those subjects to law should have a say in forming them is rejected in favor of elite rule. As von Mises put it, the flowering of human society depends on two factors— the intellectual power of outstanding men to conceive sound social and economic theories, and the ability of these or other men to make these ideologies palatable to the majority. Yet, such a task would require massive propaganda work and would only ultimately succeed by removing the majority from any say in the running of society. Once that is done... Then they have to believe that the ruling elite will be altruistic in the extreme and not abuse their position to create laws and processes which defended what they thought was legitimate property, property rights, and what constitutes aggression, which ironically contradicts the key capitalist notion that people are driven by self-gain. The obvious conclusion from such argument is that any right libertarian regime would have to exclude change. If people can change the regime they're under, they may change it in ways that right libertarians do not support. The provision for ending amendments to the regime or the law would effectively ban most opposition groups or parties as, by definition, they could do nothing once in office for minimal state libertarians or in the market for defense agencies for, uh, for uh, so-called NCAPs. How this differs from dictatorship is hard to say. After all, most dictatorships have parliamentary bodies which have no power, but which can talk a lot. Perhaps the knowledge that, is, that it is a private police enforcing private power will make those subject to the regime maximize their utility by keeping quiet and not protesting. Given this, von Mises' praise for fascism in the 1920s may be less contradictory than it first appears, as it successfully deterred democracy by crushing the labor, socialist, and anarchist movements across the world. So, Mises, Hayek, and most right libertarians, and the so-called anarcho-capitalists that are descended from this, reject the scientific method in favor of ideological correctness. If the facts contradict your theory, then they can be dismissed as too complex or unique. Facts, however, should inform theory, and any theory's methodology should take this into account. To dismiss facts out of hand is to promote dogma. This is not to suggest that a theory should be modified every time new data comes along. 
That would be crazy as unique situations do exist. Data can be both uh, can be wrong and so forth. But it does suggest that if your theory continually comes into conflict with reality, maybe it's time to rethink the theory and not assume that facts cannot invalidate it. A true libertarian would approach a contradiction between reality and theory by evaluating the facts available and changing the theory if this is required, not by ignoring reality and dismissing it as complex. Thus, much of right libertarian theory is neither libertarian nor scientific. Much of right libertarian thought is highly axiomatic, being logically deduced from such starting axioms as self-ownership, or no one should initiate force against another. Hence the importance of our discussion of von Mises, as this indicates the dangers of this approach. Namely, the tendency to ignore and dismiss the consequences of these logical chains and indeed to justify them in terms of these axioms rather than from facts. In addition, the methodology used as such is that it would be fair to argue that right libertarians get to critique reality, but reality can never be used to critique right libertarianism. For any empirical data presented as evidence is to be dismissed as too complex or unique and so irrelevant unless it can be used to support their claims, of course. Hence, W. Duncan Rieke's argument, quoting leading Austrian economist Israel Kirzner, that empirical work has the function of establishing the applicability of particular theorems and thus illustrating their operation. Confirmation of theory is not possible because there is no constants in human action, nor is it necessary because theorems themselves describe relationships logically developed from hypothesized conditions. Failure of a logically derived axiom to fit the facts does not render it invalid. Rather, it might merely indicate inapplicability to the circumstances of the case. So if facts confirm your theory, your theory is right. If facts do not confirm your theory, it's still right, just not applicable in that case. Which has the handy side effect of ensuring that facts can only be used to support the ideology, never to refute it, which is, according to this perspective, impossible anyway. As Karl Popper argued, a theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. In other words... If reality contradicts your theory, nor reality. Kropotkin hoped that those who believe in current economic doctrines will then themselves become convinced of their error as soon as they come to the necessity of verifying their quantitative deductions by quantitative investigations. However, the Austrian approach builds so many barriers to this that it's doubtful that that will ever occur. Indeed, right libertarianism, with its focus on exchange rather than its consequences, seems to be based upon justifying domination in terms of their deductions rather than analyzing what freedom actually means in terms of human existence. The real question is why, is why are such theories taken seriously and arouse such interest? Why are they not simply dismissed out of hand given their methodology and the authoritarian conclusions they produce? The answer is, at least in part, that feeble arguments can easily pass for convincing when they're on the same side as the prevailing sentiment and social system. And of course, there is the utility of such theories for ruling elites. An ideological defense of privileges, exploitation, and private power will be welcomed regardless of its merits. Noam Chomsky. Told you it was going to be 25, 30 minutes on that one. I knew that segment was going to run that way. Uh, Mitre, 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 Mitre. Thank you for the raid. I doubt you're here anymore, but thank you. I didn't turn off the raid thing. I didn't turn off the raid alert. <laughs> of all the things. I get raided all the time. Um... Turned off all the alerts. Didn't turn that one off. Um, oh, let's see. 
there is Oh my god, that's so long. That's 45 minutes. That's 45 minutes easy. That's 45 minutes easy, but like Okay, so I've got the completionist brain, right? Y'all know the completionist brain. There's one more section in chapter 1. There's one more section in chapter 1. Wait, does that? That's Uh, thanks, uh, Moshe. Um, I just studied logic a lot. I think, if, uh, I think it sounds like a rejection of Aristotelian reductionism rather than an alternative method. Um, yeah, Rumble formalized logic's a whole fucking thing. Um, <clears throat> do what you gotta do. Um, so are you going to name the playlist Dear Scott? No, I'm not going to fucking name the playlist Dear Scott. I may fucking, I may, I may, okay, I may, I may. <laughs> People will be asking that for years to come. Why is it called fucking Dear Scott? Um, no, I'll, I'll just call it Why and uh, Why and Cap, Why and Caps aren't anarchists, right? That's what I'll call it. Um, I may dedicate it to him. Seeing as he is the impetus for me doing this. Um, but. Oh. Y'all starting to see what I mean though? When I talk about this, this shit is all bad faith. Right? Like, do you, do you understand? Like, okay, so I've been, like, for those of you who've been around for a while, right? I, I, I have basically, I have this, like, snippet that I do about ANCAPs, right? It is an, an organic, a bad faith argumentation in order, to provide, in order to provide themselves political cover for their shit position. They, you know, right? Like, this is, this is, that's how I phrase it, right? Now, you're starting to understand why I say that. Going through all of these quotes, going through the logical processes that lie underneath of all of this, right? Fucking Rothbard and von, von Mises and fucking Scott's a Hoppian, by the way. Well, maybe we'll get to Hoppe. Um, and fuck, like, this is it, basically, exactly, right? Like, I don't have time. We are going to end up doing hours on this when all is said and done right when somebody asks i can't do 15 hours worth of explanation right but now you're starting to see what i mean now that we're literally iteratively going through the process uh, for twos of course he is there i mean most of these guys are in favor of slavery i'm not kidding you most of these guys are in favor of slavery like they're they're fucking psychotic. Um so yeah, like at the end of the day, right, as you start to go through these processes with me, right? Where as we go through this, and like some of you, some of you were here for the first one, right? Like the first fucking section, and you're you're getting it like all. Right? And this is this is fucking this is insane. To be able to hold this position is fucking insane. It's 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 wacky as shit, man. 
I mean, and this is this is their foundational stuff. And this is who they tell you to read, right? Fucking Cuckoo will talk about the Lockean Proviso. Yeah, all right, let's talk about the Lockean Proviso. Fucking, you know, other person who we won't name so we don't name check people on fucking stream, right? We'll talk about Hoppe and von, uh, von I think I think the correct pronunciation is Mises, actually. Um, but, you know, yeah. And, and what actually underpins all this shit is literally dogmatic a priori reasoning that stipulates if reality differs from the ideology, you go with the ideology, not reality. No, no jelly bear. Um, yeah. Oh, it's, and now, like, okay, so now imagine these people. Now imagine people with this ideological set coming into your, like, house, right? Into your house and saying, oh, I'm you, right? I'm a member of your family. No, you're not. Yeah, 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 no, I'm totally a member of your family. I'm going to ask my family. Does anybody know this fucker? No, we don't know who he is. He just barged in here and claims to be a member of our family now. Well, I'm not leaving. I'm a member of your family. And the fucking cops show up and they're like, what's going on? Oh, it's just a disagreement between family members. This motherfucker isn't a member of our family. No one in our entire family says this motherfucker is a member of our family. And yet he just stands there and goes, no, I'm a member of your family. This is just, this is just a disagreement between what family means. This is what anarchists deal with when putting up with these fucking neo-feudalists. They legitimately invade our spaces and they make claims to an ideology they have no claim to whatsoever. They just misappropriate our terminology in order to provide themselves political cover for their shit positions that legitimately end up in justifying slavery and recreating company towns in which you are a serf serving the lord of the manor. Now you understand why I'm so frustrated. Now you understand why I am dedicating fucking 15 hours to reading this document. Because apparently, I get it. People, a lot of people can't fucking dyslexia. They don't have the time. People are going to be able to put this on in the background and listen to me read it to them. Fine. This is, this is just another form of praxism, uh, a praxis that I need to do. I get it. Kai, 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 this is beside the point. Anarchy is when government is bad. Yeah, right? Fucking anti-statist idiots. State bad. It's, more, it's about more than that, morons. Oh. Uh. Okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I don't want to do it, y'all. I don't want to do it. How big are the sections, like, number twos? Number two, number two, number two. Okay, so this first section is kind of lengthy. The next ones are not too bad. I kind of want to just get it done. I'm feeling the video gamer completionist thing kick off in my brain, and I feel like I need to do this. Um... Oh, I don't, I don't know, Gemma. I don't know. Um, one other favor I'd like to ask, if you are going to hang out through this, right? If, if you're keeping an eye on chat and somebody comes in, and good idea, Burger, I will do that. If somebody comes in and starts talking at me or to me or asking questions, can somebody just tell them what's going on and that, like, I'm not ignoring them intentionally it's just we're not doing that right now. 
right? Like just, just tell them Kai normally would answer your questions, but we're re he's literally reading a thing. So he's recording that sort of thing, right? Like just, you know, please. And thank you. Oh, Yeah, just got to oh, fucking everything. Just get it all. Oh. Oh. Yeah, Kaiser. I I will. Trust me, I will. Hmm. Let me add some more. this way hang on I can't do that right there there we go oh. all right actually you know what hang on oh. Oh, there we go all right get the hip hip flexor stretched as well there oh I have to do this. The fact that I have to do this. Uh, tell me some history. Um, tell me about the old ones. Um, <laughs> Emma Goldman was such a loud mouth anarchist that she managed to get herself deported from the U S literally by pamphleting and giving lectures this woman was such a thorn in the sides of the patriarchy, the capitalists, and the authoritarians that they explicitly singled her out and said, get that bitch out of our country. And they kicked Emma Goldman out. <laughs> Love you, Emma. Um, she at Europe, and she eventually ended up back. Um, she, uh, Europe, um, uh, she traveled Europe for a while. God, I love her. Um, all right. Let me see that. Chapter ones. Section one. Okay, cool. What's a good anarchist party spot? I got none in the Midwest. Portland. 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 They'll fucking show you a good time. Um, outside of Portland, Hamburg, Germany. Um, Hamburg is a great fucking spot for anarchists. Um, you can go to St. Pauli football match in Hamburg. You're going to fucking run into, like, all... Of the embers, uh, all of the anarchists. No, not Berlin. the The anarchist team, the anarchist football team, is St. Pauli in Hamburg. Um. So if you want to find like the anarchists, go to St. Pauli. Um. <laughs> Altona also. Uh. Viva. <laughs> Of course, I've got some of the gear. Represent fucking St. Pauli. Oh. Um, also, if you're in the U.S., Vermont. Vermont. Um, if you don't want to... Um, if you don't want to go all the way across seas, okay, so you're in the middle of the country, 
right? You're you're like Midwest. Vermont in the Northeast, Portland and Seattle, but Portland more these days. Um, in the Pacific Northwest. So take your pick. Yeah. Ain't shit in the Midwest, bro. <laughs> you you live in the Midwest. You know. Ain't shit in the Midwest. Yeah. Um So, uh, yeah. All right. Here we go. We're going to have to do this. I will not be happy with myself if I don't get this done tonight. All right. It's 2.39. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, uh, fucking Joe showing me around uh, the uh, the German football scene, basically. Uh, I was like, wait, y'all fucking... The German football scene is fucking hilarious. It, it's hilarious, uh, honestly. If you don't like soccer, if you're an American and you're like, oh, soccer is boring and blah, 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 blah. Look into German soccer teams. Ger- the German way of doing soccer is hilarious because like interest groups have soccer teams right it's it's like those are the turkish soccer teams right like those that those the anarchist soccer team like that's the fucking like it's weird they have like aligned interest groups for their soccer teams it's it's fucking really interesting how they do it um They've got like, uh, Viva. What's the big fucking um, brutalist architecture one? The big team, um, that's like basically the U.S. Cowboys, um, or the Patriots, or like you know, it's like an antiquity chariot race. This was about politics. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah, Viva. Who's the? There's two teams in Berlin that are like competing. That are like sort of the. But one is like the Peoples, and the other is the We Bought Our Team. The one that is in the huge brutalist fucking stadium, um, and then the other one that is built out in the woods by volunteer labor from the fans. It, it's it's absolutely fascinating to look into the German football scene. If you don't think you like soccer. Watch a German football documentary. You'd be like, this is fucking insane. I'm in. Like, it it is. Are you a communist? There's a communist team. Uh, maybe. Uh, let me check. No, no, it's not that one. It's not that one, Cricks. Let me check it. Okay, so I think FC Union is the fucking... Yeah, FC Union is the purpose-built stadium that fucking did it, uh, like, in the woods with, like, volunteer labor from fans and shit. And then there's the, um, you know, whatever, fucking, I think it's, it's Hertha, Hertha. Um, Hertha is the, is the like Olympia state, Olympia stadium, um, that is in the fucking giant goddamn brutalist stadium. Um, it's a whole thing, y'all. It's a whole thing. Either way, legitimately, it, look into it. It's all. It's a fascinating like subculture unto itself. Um. All right. I'm just putting off the inevitable at this point. Oh. 
All right. Um, reminder to whoever is going to do that job in chat. If somebody comes in and starts talking at Kai or asking questions or whatever, please just tell them what's up and fucking, you know, thank them and be nice about it and tell them like any other time or wait till the end or that sort of thing. But for this moment in time, Kai ain't doing that sort of shit. <sighs> All right. Don't need to moo at them. <laughs> um... Based there, that's the jelly bear. I'm bit jelly bear since you're like new in here. Basically, I'm I'm trying. I've got a little mini project going on, and so I'm doing recordings of sections of a reading. Um, so I won't be able to answer any questions past when I start this recording. I'm just gonna be reading basically. Um, it's fine. You're fine right now. You're fine. I haven't started. You will see the notice in chat. I'll fucking start talking and you'll be like, what the fuck? You know, it will be very obvious. Uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up since you were asking, but based, there you go. That's, that's, um, as somebody who spent his life in it, literally his life in it and is an anarchist to boot. Let's just say I'm a fan. Uh, but again, I would never encourage any illegal activity because that would be against terms of service. Of course, by based, what I'm referring to is um, the process of adding uh, butter or fluids to a turkey. What What is hacktivism? I have no idea what you're talking about. Anyway. It's going to be a long one, y'all. This is going to probably give me 40, 45 minutes. Chapter one, section four. Is anarcho-capitalism a new form of individualist anarchism? Some so-called anarcho-capitalists shy away from the term, preferring such expressions as market anarchist or individualist anarchist. This suggests that there is some link between their ideology and that of Tucker. However, the founder of so-called anarcho-capitalism, Murray Rothbard, refused that label for, while strongly tempted, he could not do so because Spooner and Tucker have, in a sense, preempted that name for their doctrine and that from, and that, from that doctrine I have certain differences. Somewhat incredibly, Rothbard argued that, on the whole, politically, these differences are minor. Economically, the differences are substantial, and this means that my view of the consequences of putting our more or less common system into practice is far, very far from theirs. You can see the Spooner-Tucker Doctrine and Economist View in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, Volume 20, Number 1, Page 7 for this quote. What an understatement. Individualist anarchists advocated an economic system in which there would have been very little inequality of wealth and so of power, and the accumulation of capital would have been minimal without profit, interest, and rent. Removing this social and economic basis would result in substantially different political regimes. This can be seen from the fate of Viking Iceland, where a substantially communal and anarchistic system was destroyed from within by increasing inequality and the rise of tenant farming. In other words, politics is not isolated from economics. As David Wick put, uh, Wick put it, Rothbard writes of society as though some part of it, government, can be extracted and replaced by another arrangement while other things go on before. And he constructs a system of police and judicial power without any consideration of the influence of historical and economic context. See Anarchist Justice in Nomos Pen and Chap uh, Pennock and Chapman editions, page 227. Unsurprisingly, the political differences he highlights are significant, namely the role of law in the jury system and the land question. The former differences relates to the fact that the individualist anarchists allowed each individual free market court and more specifically each free market jury totally free reign over judicial decision. This horrified Rothbard. 
The reason is obvious, as it allows real people to judge the law as well as the facts. Modifying the former as society changes and evolves. For Rothbard, the idea that ordinary people should, let alone could, have a say in the law is dismissed outright. Rather, quote, it would not be a very difficult task for libertarian lawyers and jurists to arrive at a rational and objective code of libertarian legal principles and procedures. Of course, the fact that lawyers and jurists may have a radically different idea of what is just than those subject to their laws is not raised by Rothbard. <laughs> Never mind, answered. While Rothbard notes that juries may defend the people against the state, the notion that they may defend the people against the authority and power of the rich is not raised. That is why the rich have tended to oppose juries as well as popular assemblies. Unsurprisingly, the few individualist anarchists that remained pointed this out. Lawrence Labadee, the son of Tucker, associate uh, Joseph Labadee, argued in response to Rothbard as follows, quote, mere common sense would suggest that any court would be influenced by experience and any free market court or judge would be in the very nature of things, have some precedents guiding them in their instructions to a jury. But since no case is exactly the same, a jury would have considered would have considerable say about the heinousness of the offense in each case, realizing that circumstances alter cases and prescribing penalty accordingly. This appeared to Spooner and Tucker to be a more flexible and equitable administration of justice, possible or feasible, human beings what they are. But when Mr. Rothbard quibbles about the jurisprudential ideas of Spooner and Tucker, and at the same time upholds, presumably in his courts, the very economic evils which are at the bottom, the very reason for human contention and conflict, he would seem to be a man who chokes at a gnat while swallowing a camel. In other words... To exclude the general population from any say in the law and how it changes is hardly a minor difference, particularly if you're proposing an economic system which is based on inequalities of wealth, power, and influence and the means of accumulating more. It's like a supporter of the state saying that it's a minor difference if you favor a dictatorship rather than a democratically elected government. As Tucker argued, quote, it is precisely in the tempering of the rigidity of enforcement that one of the chief excellences of anarchism consists. Under anarchism, all rules and laws will be little more than suggestions for the guidance of juries, and that all disputes will be submitted to juries which will judge not only the facts but the law, the justice of the law, its applicability to the given circumstances, and the penalty or damage to be inflicted because of its infraction. Under anarchism, the law will be regarded as just in proportion to its flexibility instead of now in proportion to its rigidity. Individual Anarchist, pages 160 to 161. In others, the law will evoke to take into account changing social circumstances and as a consequence, public opinion on specific events and rights. Tucker's position is fundamentally democratic and evolutionary, while Rothbard's is autocratic and fossilized. On the land question, Rothbard opposed the individualist position of occupancy and use, as it would automatically abolish all rent payments for land. Hmm which was precisely why the individualist anarchist advocated for it in the first place. In a predominantly rural economy, this would result in a significant leveling of income and social power, as well as bolstering the bargaining position of non-land workers by reducing unemployment. He, of course, bemoans that landlords cannot charge rent on their justly acquired private property without noticing that it's begging the question as anarchists deny that this is justly acquired land. 
Unsurprisingly, Rothbard considers the property theory of land ownership as John Locke's, ignoring the fact that the first self-proclaimed anarchist book was written to refute that kind of theory. Property is theft, after all. His argument simply shows how far from anarchism his ideology is. For Rothbard, it goes without saying that the landlord's freedom of contract tops the worker's freedom to control their own work and live and, of course, their right to life. However, for anarchists, the land is indispensable to our existence, consequently a common thing, consequently insusceptible of, 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 uh, of appropriation. Proudhon, what is property? Page 107. The reason question is why Rothbard considers this a political difference rather than an economic one. Unfortunately, he doesn't explain, perhaps because the underlying socialist perspective behind the anarchist position, or perhaps the fact that feudalism and monarchism was based on the ownership of the land being its ruler suggests a political aspect to the ideology best left unexplored. They are neo-feudalists after all. Given that the idea of grounding rulership on land ownership receded during the Middle Ages, it may be unwise to note that under so-called anarcho-capitalism, the landlord and capitalist would likewise be sovereign over the land and those who used it. As we noted in Section 1, this is the conclusion that Rothbard does draw after all. As such, there is a political aspect to this difference. Of course, Rothbard is simply skimming the surface. There are two ways so-called anarcho-capitalists differ from individualist anarchists. The first one is the fact that the individualist anarchists are socialists. The second is on whether equality is, essentially, is essential or not to anarchism. Each will be discussed in turn. Unlike both individualist and social anarchists, so-called anarcho-capitalists support capitalism, a pure free market type, which has never existed, although it has been approximated occasionally. This means that they reject totally the ideas of anarchists, which with regards to property and economic analysis. For example, like all supporters of capitalists, they consider rent, profit, and interest as valid incomes. Of course, not if they truly studied Adam Smith, you know the father of capitalism, who was against the rentier class entirely. In contrast, all anarchists consider these as exploitation and agree with the individualist anarchist Benjamin Tucker, for example, when he argued that whoever contributes to production is alone entitled. What has no rights that who is bound to respect? What is a thing? Who is a person? Things have no claims. They exist only to be claimed. The possession of a right cannot be predicated of, de uh, of dead material, but only of a living thing. This, we must note, is the fundamental critique of the capitalist theory, that capital is productive. In and of themselves, fixed costs do not create value. Rather, value is creation depends on how investments are developed and used once in place. Because of this, the individualist anarchists, like other anarchists, consider non-labor-derived income as usury, unlike so-called anarcho-capitalists. Similarly, anarchists reject the notion of capitalist property rights in favor of possession, including the full fruits of one's labor. For example, anarchists reject private, pro uh, private ownership of land in favor of an occupancy and use regimen. See, in this, we follow Proudhon's What is Property and argue that property is theft. Rothbard, as noted, rejects this perspective. As these ideas are essentially a part, uh, essential part of anarchist politics, they cannot be removed without seriously damaging the rest of the theory. This can be seen from Tucker's comments that liberty insists on the abolition of the state and the abolition of usury on no more government of man by man and no more exploitation of man by man. 
He indicates that anarchism has specific economic and political ideas that it opposes capitalism along with the state. Therefore, anarchism was never purely a political concept, but always combined in opposition to oppression with an opposition to exploitation. The social anarchists made exactly the same point, which means that when Tucker argued that liberty insists on socialism, true socialism, anarchistic socialism, the pre prevalence of earth of liberty, equality, and solidarity, he knew exactly what he was saying, and he likely meant it wholeheartedly. So because so-called anarcho-capitalists embrace capitalism and reject socialism, communalism, communism, and other forms of communitarianism, they cannot be considered anarchists or a part of any anarchist tradition. Which brings us nicely to the second point, namely the lack of concern for equality. In stark contrast to anarchists of, uh, anarchists of all schools, inequality is not to be a problem with these so-called anarcho-capitalists. However, it is a truism that not all traders are equally subject to the market, i.e. have the same market power. In many cases, a few have sufficient control of resources to influence or determine price, and in such cases, all others must submit to those terms or not buy the commodity. When the commodity is labor power, even this option is lacking. Workers have, have to accept a job in order to live. As will be argued in section 10.2, workers are usually at a disadvantage on the labor market when compared to capitalists, and this forces them to sell their liberty in return for making profits for others. These profits increase inequality in society as the property owners receive the surplus value their workers produce. This is the labor theory of value. And while you may think this is Marx, this is Smith, the father of capitalism, pointed this out. This increases inequality further consolidating market power, and so weakens the bargaining position of workers further, ensuring that even the freest competition possible could not eliminate class power in society, something Tucker recognized as occurring with the development of trusts within capitalism. By removing the underlying commitment to abolish non-labor income, any anarchist capitalist society would have vast differences in wealth and, and so power. Instead of a government imposed monopolies in land, money, and so on, the economic power flowing from private property and capital would ensure that the majority remained in, to use Spooner's words, the condition of servants. The individualist anarchists were aware of this danger and so supported economic ideas that opposed usury, the rentier class, rent, profit, interest, and ensured the worker the full value of his, her, or their labor. While not all of them called these ideas socialist, it is clear that these ideas are socialist in nature and in aim. Similarly, not all individualist anarchists called themselves anarchists, but their ideas are clearly anarchist in nature and in aim. The combination of the political and economic is essential as they mutually reinforce each other. Without the economic ideas, the political ideas would be meaningless as inequality would make a mockery of them. As Klein notes, the individualist anarchists' proposals were designed to establish true equality of opportunity, and they expected this would result in a society without great wealth or poverty. In the absence of monopolistic factors which would distort competition, they expected a society largely of self-employed workmen with no significant disparity of wealth between them, since all would be required to live at their own expense and not at the expense of exploited fellow human beings. Because of the evil effects of inequality on freedom, both social and individualist anarchists desired to create an environment in which circumstances would not drive people to sell their liberty to others at a disadvantage. In other words, they desired an equalization of market power by opposing interest, rent, and profit in capitalist definitions of private property. 
Klein summarized this by saying, the American individualist anarchist exposed the tension existing in liberal thought between private property and the ideal of equal access. The individual anarchists were at least aware that existing conditions were far from ideal and that the system itself working against the majority of individuals in their efforts to attain its promises. Lack of capital, the means to create and accumulate wealth, usually doomed a laborer to a life of exploitation. This the anarchists knew, and they abhorred such a system. It's this desire for bargaining equality that is reflected in their economic ideas. And by removing these underlying economic ideas of the individualist anarchists, these so-called anarcho-capitalists make a mockery of any ideas they do appropriate. Essentially, the individualist anarchists agreed with Rousseau that in order to prevent extreme inequality of fortunes, you deprive people of the means to accumulate in the first place and not take away the wealth from the rich. An important point which, again, so-called anarcho-capitalists fail to even understand, let alone appreciate. There are, of course, overlaps between some of the individualist anarchists and the so-called anarcho-capitalists, just as there are overlaps between it and Marxism and social anarchism. However, just as a similar analysis of capitalism does not make an individualist anarchist Marxist, so apparent similarities between individualist anarchism does not make it a forerunner of anarcho-capitalism. For example, both schools support the idea of free markets, Yet, the question of markets is fundamentally second to the issue of property rights, for what is exchanged on the market is dependent on what is considered legitimate property. In this, as Rothbard notes, individualist anarchists and so-called anarcho-capitalists differ, and different property rights produce different market structures and different dynamics. This means that capitalism is not the only economy with markets, and so support for markets cannot be equated with support for capitalism. Equally, opposition to markets is not the defining characteristic of socialism, as we will note later on. As such, it is possible to be a market socialist, and many socialists are. This is because markets and property do not equal capitalism. Quote Mar Karl Marx in Das Kapital, Volume 1, page 931. Political economy confuses on principle two very different types of private property. One, which rests on the labor of the producers himself, and the other on the exploitation of the labor of others. It forgets that the latter is not only the direct antithesis of the former, but grows on the former's tomb and nowhere else. In Western Europe, the homeland of political economy, the process of primitive accumulation is more of less accomplished. It is otherwise in the colonies. There, the capitalist regime constantly comes up against the obstacle presented by the producer who, as owner of his own condition of labor, employs that labor to enrich himself instead of the capitalist. The contradiction of these two diametrically opposed economic systems has its practical manifestation here in the struggle between them. Individualist anarchism is obviously an aspect of this struggle, uh, struggle between the system of peasant and artisan production of early America and the state-encouraged system of private property and wage labor. These so-called anarcho-capitalists, in contrast, assume that generalized wage labor would remain under their system while paying lip service to the possibilities of cooperatives. And if a so-called anarcho-capitalist thinks that cooperatives will become the dominant form of workplace organization, then they're some kind of market socialist, not a capitalist. It is clear that their endpoint, a pure capitalism, 
i.e. generalized wage labor, is directly the opposite of that desired by anarchists. This was the case of the individualist anarchists who embraced the ideal of non-capitalist laissez-faire competition. They did so, as noted, to end exploitation, not to maintain it. Indeed, their analysis of the change in American society from one of mainly independent producers into one based mainly upon wage labor has many parallels with, of all people, Karl Marx presented in chapter 33 of Das Kapital. Marx correctly argues that the capitalist mode of production and accumulation and therefore capitalist private property have for their fundamental condition the annihilation of that private property which rests on the labor of the individual himself. In other words, the expropriation, expropriation of the worker. He notes that to achieve this, the state is then used. How then can the anti-capitalistic cancer of the colonies be healed? Let the government set an artificial price on the virgin soil, a price independent of the law of supply and demand, a price that compels the immigrant to work a long time for wages before he can earn enough money to buy land and turn himself into an independent farmer. Moreover, tariffs are introduced with, quote, the objective of manufacturing capitalists artificially for the system of production was an artificial means of manufacturing manufacturers or expropriating independent workers, of capitalizing the national means of production and subsistence, and of forcibly cutting short the transition to the modern mode of production. It is this process which individualist anarchists protested against, the use of the state to favor the rising capitalist class. However, unlike social anarchists, many individualist anarchists were not consistently against wage labor. This is the other significant overlap between these so-called anarcho-capitalists and individualist anarchism. However, they were opposed to exploitation and argued unlike the so-called anarcho-capitalists, that in their system, workers' bargaining powers would be raised to a level that their wages would equal the full product of their labor. However, as we will discuss, the social context the individualist anarchists lived in must be remembered America at the time was a predominantly rural society, and industry was not as developed as it is now. Wage labor would have been minimized. Spooner, for example, explicitly envisioned a society made up of mostly entirely of self-employed workers. As Klein argues, quote, Committed as they were to equality in the pursuit of property, the objective for the anarchists became the construction of a society providing equal access to those things necessary for creating wealth. The goal of the anarchists who extolled mutualism and the abolition of all monopolies was then a society where everyone willing to work would have the tools and raw materials necessary for production in a non-exploitative system. The dominant vision of the future society was underpinned by individual self-employed workers. As such, a limited amount of wage labor within a predominantly self-employed economy does not make a given society capitalist, any more than a small amount of governmental communities within a predominantly anarchist world would make it statist. As Marx argued, when the separation of the worker from the conditions of labor and from the soil does not yet exist or only sporadically or on too limited a scale where, where amongst such curious characters is the field of abstinence for the capitalist. Today's wage labor is tomorrow's independent peasant or artisan working for himself. He vanishes from the labor market but not into the warehouse. There is a constant transformation of wage laborers into independent producers who work for themselves instead of for capital. And so the degree of exploitation of the wage laborer remains indecently low. In addition, the wage laborer also loses, along with the relation of dependence, the feeling of dependence on the abstentious capitalist. I'm sorry, abstemious capitalist. 
Saying that, as we discuss in a future section, individualist anarchist support for wage labor is at odds with the ideas of Proudhon, and far more importantly, in contradiction to, say, uh, to many of the stated principles of the individualist anarchists themselves. In particular, wage labor violates occupancy, occupancy and use, as well as having more than a passing similarity to the state. However, these problems can't be solved by consistently applying the principles of individualist anarchism, unlike so-called anarcho-capitalism. And that is why it is a real school of anarchism. In other words, a system of generalized wage labor would not be anarchist, nor would it be non-exploitative. Moreover, the social context these ideas were developed in and would have been applied ensured that these contradictions would have been minimized. If they had been applied, a genuine anarchist society of self-employed workers would, in all likelihood, have been created at least first, whether the market would increase in inequalities is a moot point. We must stress that the social situation is important as it shows apparently superficially similar arguments can have radically different aims and results depending on who suggests them and in what circumstances. As noted, during the rise of capitalism, the bourgeoisie were not shy in urging state intervention against the masses. Unsurprisingly, working class people generally took an anti-state position during this period. The individualist anarchists were a part of that tradition, opposing what Marx termed primitive accumulation in form of the pre-capitalist forms of property and society it was destroying. However, when capitalism found its feet and could do without such obvious intervention, the possibility of an anti-state capitalism could arise. Such a possibility became a definite one once the state started to intervene in, which, uh, in ways which, while benefiting the system as a whole, came into conflict with the property and power of individual members of the capitalist and landlord class. Thus, social legislation which attempted to restrict the negative effects of unbridled exploitation and oppression on workers and the environment were having on the economy were, were the source of much outrage in certain bourgeois circles. Quote, Quite independently of these tendencies of individualist anarchism, the anti-state bourgeoisie, which is also anti-statist, being hostile to any social intervention on the part of the state to protect the victims of exploitation in the matter of working hours, hygienic working conditions, and so on, in the greed of unlimited exploitation, had stirred up in England a certain agitation in favor, in favor of pseudo-individualism in unrestrained exploitation, to this end, they enlisted the services of a mercenary pseudo-literature which played with doctrinaire and fanatical ideas in order to protect a species of individualism that was absolutely sterile and a species of non-interventionism that would let a man die of hunger rather than offend his dignity. Max Netlau, A Short History of Anarchism, page 39. This perspective can be seen when Tucker denounced Herbert Spencer as a champion of the capitalist class for his vocal attacks on social legislation which claimed to benefit the working class people but stays silently strange on the laws passed to benefit, usually indirectly, capital and the rich. So-called anarcho-capitalism is a part of that tradition. The tradition associated with a capitalism which no longer needs obvious state intervention as enough wealth has been accumulated to keep workers under control by means of market power. As with the original 19th century British anti-state capitalists like Spencer and Herbert, Rothbard, quote, completely overlooks the role of the state in building and maintaining a capitalist economy in the West privileged to live in the 20th century long after the battles to establish capitalism have been fought and won, Rothbard sees the state solely as a burden on the market and a vehicle for imposing the still greater burden of socialism. He manifests a kind of historical nearsightedness that allows him to collapse many centuries of human experience into one long night of tyranny that ended only with the intervention of the free market and its spontaneous triumph over the past. 
it is pointless to argue, as Rothbard seems ready to do, that capitalism would have succeeded without the bourgeois state. The fact is that all capitalist nations have relied on the machinery of government to create and preserve the political and legal environments required by their economic system. That, of course, has not stopped him criticizing others for being unhistorical. Stephen L. Newman, Liberalism at Wit's End, pages 77, 78, and 79. In other words... There is substantial differences between the victims of a thief trying to stop being robbed and be left alone to enjoy their property and the successful thief doing the same. Individualist anarchists were aware of this. For example, for example, Victor Yaros stressed this key difference between individualist anarchism and the proto-libertarian capitalist of voluntarianism. Aubert Hubert, Aubert Hubert, um, believes in allowing people to retain all their possessions, no matter how unjustly and base, uh, base, uh, basely requ- acquired, while getting them, so to speak, to swear off stealing and usurping and to promise to behave well in the future. We, on the other hand, while insisting on the principle of private property in wealth honestly obtained under the reign of liberty, do not think it either unjust or unwise to dispossess the landlords who have monopolized natural wealth by force and fraud. We hold that the poor and disinherited toilers would be justified in expropriating, not alone the landlords who notoriously have no equitable titles to their land, but all the financial lords and rulers, all the millionaires and billionaires, and trillionaires, and very wealthy individuals. Almost all possessors of great wealth enjoy neither what they nor their ancestors rightfully acquired. And if Mr. Herbert wishes to challenge the correctness of this state statement, we are ready to go with him into a full discussion of the subject. If he holds that landlords are justly entitled to their lands, let him make a defense of the landlords or an attack on our unjust proposal. Quoted by Karl Wattner, the English individualists as they appear in Liberty, pages 191 to 211. Benjamin R. Tucker in the Champions of Liberty, Coughlin, Hamilton, Sullivan, pages 199 to 200. Significantly, Tucker and other individualist anarchists saw state intervention as a result of capital manipulating legislation to gain an advantage on the so-called free market which allowed them to exploit labor, and as such, it benefited the whole capitalist class. Rothbard, at best, acknowledges that some sections of big business benefit from the current system and so fails to have the comprehensive understanding of the dynamics of the capitalist, capitalism as a system, rather as an ideology. This lack of understanding of capitalism as a historic and dynamic system rooted in class rule and economic power is important in evaluating this so-called anarcho-capitalist claims to anarchism. Marxists are not considered anarchists as they support the state as a means of transition to an anarchist society. Much the same logic can be applied to right-wing libertarians, even if they do call themselves so-called anarcho-capitalists. This is because they do not seek to correct the inequalities produced by previous state action before ending it, nor do they seek to change the definitions of private property imposed by the state. In effect, they argue that the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie should wither away and be limited to defending the property accumulated in a few hands. Needless to say, starting from the current coercively produced distribution of property and then eliminating force simply means defending the power and privilege of ruling minorities. The modern individualism initiated by Herbert Spencer is, like the critical theory of Proudhon, a powerful indictment against the dangers and wrongs of government, but its practical solution of the social problem is miserable, so miserable as to lead us to inquire if the talk of no force be merely an excuse for supporting landlord and capitalist domination. For these so-called anarcho-capitalists, the concept of freedom is limited to the idea of freedom from. 
For them, freedom means simply freedom from the initiation of force or the non-aggression against an anyone's person and property. Murray Rothbard for A New Liberty, page 23. It's a direct quote. The notion that real freedom must combine both freedom to and freedom from is missing in their ideology, as is the social context of the, social, uh, of the so-called freedom they defend. Before starting, it's useful to quote Alan Hayworth when he notes that, in fact, it is surprising how little close attention the concept of freedom rece receives from libertarian writers. Once again, anarchy, state, and utopia is a case in point. The word freedom doesn't even appear in the index. The word liberty appears, but only to refer to the reader, uh, only to refer the reader to Wilt Chamberlain in a passage. In a supposedly libertarian work, this is more surprising. It's truly remarkable. Why is this the case? Can be seen. Oh, why this is the case can be seen from how these so-called anarcho-capitalists define freedom. In a right libertarian or so-called anarcho-capitalist society, freedom is considered to be a product of property. As Murray Rothbard puts it, the libertarian defines the concept of freedom or liberty as a condition in which a person's ownership rights in his body and his legitimate material property rights are not invaded, are not aggressed against. Freedom and unrestricted property rights go hand in hand. This definition has problems, however. In such a society, one cannot legitimately do anything with or on another, uh, another's property if the owner prohibits it. This means that an individual's only guaranteed freedom is determined by the amount of property that he or she or they own. This has the consequence that someone with no property has no guaranteed freedom at all beyond, of course, the freedom to not be murdered or otherwise harmed by deliberate act of others, maybe. In other words, a distribution of property is a distribution of freedom. As the right libertarians themselves define it, it strikes anarchists as strange that an ideology that claims to be committed to promoting freedom entails the conclusion that some people should be more free than others? However, this is the logical implication of their view, which raises a serious doubt as to whether so-called anarcho-capitalists are even actually interested in freedom. Looking at Rothbard's definition of liberty quoted, we can see that the freedom is actually no longer considered to be a fundamental independent concept. Instead, freedom is a derivative of something more fundamental, namely the legitimate rights of an individual, which are identified then as property rights. In other words, given that these so-called anarcho-capitalists and right libertarians in general consider the right to property as absolute, it follows that freedom and property become one and the same. This suggests an alternative name for the right libertarian, namely, propertarian. And needless to say, if we do not accept that right libertarian view of what constitutes legitimate rights, then their claim to be defenders of liberty is weak at best. Another implication of this liberty as property concept is that it produces a strangely alienated concept of freedom. Liberty, as we noted, is no longer absolute, but a derivative of property, which has the important consequence that you can sell your liberty and still be considered free by the ideology. This concept of liberty, namely liberty as property, is usually termed self-ownership, but to state the obvious... I don't own myself, as if I were an object somehow separable from my subjectivity. I am myself. However, the concept of self-ownership is handy for justifying various forms of domination and oppression. For by agreeing, usually under the force of circumstances, we must note, to certain contracts, you'll find that libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists love that word, by agreeing to certain contracts, an individual can sell or rent themselves to others. For example, when workers sell their labor power to capitalists on the 
free market. In effect, self-ownership becomes the means of justifying treating people as objects. Ironically, the very thing the concept was created to stop. As L. Susan Brown noted, at the moment an individual sells labor power to another, they lose self-determination and instead are treated as a subjectless, in, a subjectless instrument for the fulfillment of another's will. Page four of The Politics of Individualism. Given that workers are paid to obey, you really have to wonder which planet Murray Rothbard is on when he argues that a person's labor service is alienable, but his will is not. That he cannot alienate his will, more particularly his control over his own mind and body. He says this literally in The Ethics of Liberty, page 40 and 135. He contrasts private property and self-ownership by arguing that, quote, all physical property owned by a person is alienable, and I can give away or sell to another person my shoes, my house, my car, my money. But there are certain vital things which, in natural fact and in the nature of man, are inalienable. Their will and control over their own person are inalienable. But labor services are unlike the private possessions Rothbard lists as being alienable. We will argue later on in Why Do Anarchists Oppose Hierarchy? A person's labor services and will cannot be divided. If you sell your labor services, you also have to give control of your body and mind to another person. If a worker does not obey the commands of their employer, they are fired. That Rothbard denies this indicates a total lack of common sense or potentially bad faith argumentation. Perhaps Rothbard will argue that as the worker can quit at any time, it does not alienate their will. This seems to be his case against slave contracts, but... This ignores the fact that between the signing and breaking of the contract and during work hours and perhaps outside work hours if the boss has mandatory drug testing or will fire workers who attend union or anarchist meetings or those who have unnatural sexuality and so on, the worker does alienate their will and body. In the words of Rudolf Rocker, quote, under the realities of the capitalist economic form, there can be no talk of a right over one's own person, for that ends when one is compelled to submit to the economic dictation of another if he does not want to starve. Anarcho-syndicalism, page 17. Ironically, the rights of property, which are said to flow from an individual's self-ownership of themselves, becomes the means under capitalism by which self-ownership of non-property owners is denied. The foundational right, self-ownership, becomes denied by the derivative right, ownership of things. Under capitalism, a lack of property can be just as oppressive as a lack of legal rights because of the relationships of domination and subjection this situation creates. So Rothbard's argument, as well as being contradictory, misses the point and the reality of capitalism. Yes, if we define freedom as the absence of coercion, then the idea that wage labor does not restrict liberty is unavoidable, but such a definition is useless. This is because it hides the structures of power and relations of domination and subordination. As Carol Payton argued, the contract in which the worker allegedly sells his labor power is a contract in which, since he cannot be separated from his capacities, he sells command over the use of his body and himself. To sell command over the use of oneself for a specified period is to be an unfree laborer. The sexual contract, page 151. In other words, <clears throat> contracts about property in the person inevitably create subordination. These so-called so -called, so anarcho-capitalists define this source of unfreedom away, but it still exists and has a major impact on people's liberty. Therefore, 
Freedom is better described as self-government or self-management. To be able to govern one's own actions if alone or to, be, or, or to participate in the determination of joint activity if part of a group. Freedom, to put it another way, is not an abstract legal concept but a vital concrete possibility for every human being to bring to full development all of their powers, capacities, and talents which nature has endowed them. A key aspect of this is to govern, one, govern one's own actions when within associations, self-management. We, If we look at freedom this way, we see that coercion is condemned, but so is hierarchy and so is capitalism. For during working hours, people are not free to make their own plans and have a say in what affects them. They are order takers, not free individuals. It's, it is because anarchists have recognized the authoritarian nature of capitalist firms that they have opposed wage labor and capitalist property rights along with the state. They've desired to replace institutions structured by subordination with institutions constituted by free relationships based, in other words, on self-management in all areas of life, including economic organizations. Hence, Proudhon's argument that the workmen's associations are full of hope, both as a protest against the wage system and as an affirmation of reciprocity. And that their importance lies in, in their denial of the rule of capitalists, moneylenders, and governments. The general idea of revolution, pages 98 and 99. Unlike anarchists, the so-called anarcho-capitalists, account of freedom allows an individual's freedom to be rented out to another while maintaining that the person is still free. It may, see, it may seem strange that an ideology proclaiming its support for liberty sees nothing wrong with the alienation and denial of liberty, but in actual fact, it's unsurprising. After all, contract theory is a theoretical strategy that justifies subjection by presenting it as freedom and nothing more. Little wonder, then, that contract creates a relation of subordination and not of freedom. Any attempt to build an ethical framework starting from the abstract individual, as Rothbard does with his legitimate rights method, will result in domination and oppression between people, not freedom. Indeed, Rothbard provides an example of the dangers of idealist philosophy that Bakunin warned about when he argued that while materialism denies free will and ends in the establishment of liberty, idealism in the name of human dignity pro proclaims free will and on the ruins of every liberty founds authority. This is the case with the so-called anarcho-capitalists. This can be seen from Rothbard's wholehearted support for wage labor and the rules imposed by property owners on those who use but do not own their property. Rothbard basing himself on abstract individualism cannot help but justify authority over liberty. Overall, we can see that the logic of the right libertarian definition of freedom ends up negating itself because it results in the creation and encouragement of authority, which is the opposite of freedom. For example, as Ayn Rand points out, quote, man has to sustain his life by his own effort. The man who has no right to, who the product of his effort has no means to, to, to sustain his life. The man who produces while others dispose of his product is a slave. The Ayn Rand lexicon, Objectivism from A to Z, pages 388 and to 389. But as is shown, capitalism is based on, as Proudhon put it, workers working for an entrepreneur who pays them and keeps their products. And so is a form of theft. Thus, by libertarian capitalism's own logic, capitalism is not based on freedom, but on wage slavery. For interest, profit, and rent are derived from a worker's unpaid labor. And if a society is run on the wage and profit-based system suggested by these so-called anarcho-capitalists and libertarian capitalists, freedom becomes a commodity. The more money you have, the more freedom you get. Then, since money is only available to those who earn it, 
libertarianism is based on that classic saying. Arbit Mike Frey. Work makes one free. Which the Nazis placed on the gates of their concentration camps. Of course, since it is capitalism, this motto is somewhat different from those at the top. In this case, it is other people's work make one free. A truism in any society based on private property and the authority that stems from it. Thus, it is debatable that a libertarian or so-called anarcho-capitalist society would have less unfreedom or coercion in it than actually existing capitalism. In contrast to anarchism, so-called anarcho-capitalism with its narrow definitions restricts freedom to only a few aspects of social life and ignores domination and authority beyond those aspects. As Peter Marshall pointed out, the right libertarian's definition of freedom is entirely negative. It calls for the absence of coercion but cannot guarantee the positive freedom of individual autonomy and independence. By confining freedom to such a narrow range of human action, these so-called anarcho-capitalists are, not, are clearly not a form of, ca uh, of anarchism. Real anarchists support freedom in every aspect of an individual's life. <sighs> 53 minutes and 24 seconds. Jesus, goddamn Christ. Thanks. For those of you that stuck it out, props and thank you. Holy shit, man. Wow. That was a clip. That was a fucking clip. Uh yeah, burger, I'm 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 alive. <laughs> I'm alive. Whew. Oh. Oh. Oh, but when, when all is said and done, and by the way, we just finished chapter one. I'm not kidding you guys. There's 12 chapters. There's, there's, I'm sorry. There's 11, there's 11 sections. We just finished section one. All right. Section two has eight sections. That one had four. I'm not kidding you. Like, this is, dude, this document is ridiculous, but it needs doing. As near as I can tell, nobody's ever put this to, like, audio. Nobody's ever put this shit to audio, and it needs to, apparently. So, somebody's got to do it, man. Somebody's got to fucking do it. Uh, let's see. Let me see it. Chapter one, section four. Is that out of sync? That looks like that's out of fucking sync. Um, I'll download it though. Let's see. Quick by D. Those are the other clips from this stream. Cool. Um. Can I do? Okay, cool. All right. I'm, uh, well, I need to, hold on. I need to re-enable a bunch of stuff too before I forget. Um, raids, got subscriptions enabled. I wish I could, like, I wish I had, like, absolutely, like, from the beginning... Um, quitting wage slavery and the the phrase work will set you free blew me away. I I told you this is a really well done document. It, it is the work of multiple people. This is this is a collective work. This this document is not a single author. It's many authors. Um, and so like this is this is a collectivist action, 
And so like, I'm just adding like a new media element to it basically. Um, that's all. Um, so yeah. Um, but, Oh, that was a stretch. I don't even feel like, let's see. All right. Did I, I did all that. I did all that. Um, What is section two? What is chapter two? Holy shit, scrolling all that. Um, what are the implications of defining liberty in terms of property rights? How does private property affect freedom? Can anarcho-capitalist theory justify the state? But surely transactions on the market are voluntary, but surely circumstances are the result of liberty and so cannot be objected to. Do libertarian capitalists support slavery? Yes. But surely abolishing capitalism would restrict liberty. Why should we reject the anarcho-capitalist definitions of freedom and justice? Uh, section three. Why is the disregard for equality important? What about the anarcho-capitalist support for charity? Um, four, what is wrong with a homes with a homesteading theory of property? What is why is the Lockean proviso important? Um, how does private property affect individualism? How does private property affect relationships? Uh, does private property coordinate with higher without hierarchy? Five is why will privatizing the commons increase liberty? Six is what's wrong with this free market justi justice? Why, what are the social consequences of such a system? But surely market forces will stop abuse by the rich. Why are, the defense, uh, why are these uh, defense associations states? So numbers 6.3 and 6.4 is basically responding directly to one of our favorite people. What are other effects? Uh, what other effects would free market justice have? Seven... Are competing governments anarchism? Are, is government compatible with anarchism? Can there be a right-wing anarchism? Eight, what social forces lay behind the rise of capitalism? What was the social context of the statement laissez-faire? What other forms did state interventionism in creating capitalism take? Aren't the enclosures a socialist myth? What about the lack of enclosures in the Americas? How did working people view the rise of capitalism? Why is the history of capitalism important? Nine, is medieval Iceland an example of anarcho-capitalism working in practice? Ten, would privatizing banking make capitalism stable? How does the labor market affect capitalism? How, um, how was laissez-faire capitalism stable? Section 11, why natural law in the first place? But natural law provides protection for individual rights from violation by the state. Those against natural law desire total rule by the state. Why is natural law authoritarian? Does natural law actually provide protection for individual liberty? But natural law was discovered, not invented. Why is the notion of discover a discovery contradiction? Jesus Christ. We've got, dude, we got a lot of work ahead of us. And by, <laughs> Jesus. Oh. Do y'all understand why I'm fucking so sick of these goddamn ANCAPs at this point? Right? Like, could you imagine writing this document? You imagine having to do the ci sourcing and citations for this? Right? Like, imagine, imagine having to interact with so many ANCAPs that you know their arguments this well. Right? Like, literally, that you're just like a fucking, a 500-page a, a document full of refuting their bullshit right like imagine talking to that many yeah i really do and you can feel that same annoyance from the authors yeah i know right like it's it's like holy shit man imagine interacting with this many ancaps oh all right i'm doing a thing y'all i'm doing a thing I need to, I need to just, I need to just shut the fuck up and take a bath 
Doc, professor doctor in debunking NCAP's BS. Yeah, dude, we're going to have a master course. This thing is a master course. I'm not going to sleep, but I'm going to fucking take a nice hot bath. I'm going to fucking lay down in a bath and like browse Reddit and just numb out. Holy shit, man. But we're going to get it done. For those, for these long haulers and the ones who are regulars and shit. Um... I mean, I'm an essayist burger. I'd never write a 500 page document, but for you long haulers and you regulars who are going to be here for like, I like Cricks, like I have this feeling Cricks is probably going to hear all of these segments, right? Like I do mad respect to anybody who makes it through all of this stuff. Um, either way, anybody who hangs, anybody who's here, I value the time you spend with me. I love you guys. We're going to go right over to fucking public. Public's good people. Let's just let's just say hi to public and go from there, y'all. Holy shit, man. <laughs> Fuck. I can't believe I'm doing this project, but we're doing this project. So uh tomorrow's Friday, bed movie night. Catch you later.